to talk about drugs that affect autonomic function. We're going to talk about cholinergic drugs versus adrenergic drugs. We're going to talk about um, muscarinic agonists, drugs that activate muscarinic receptors, muscarinic antagonists. We're going to talk about choline esterase inhibitors. Okay. Choline esterase. What does choline esterase do? Anybody know? Breaks down something. Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Okay. Now, there, there is something about, it's an interesting truth about all synapses, neuronal synapses in our body. And that is that they do a lot of um, housekeeping. Okay. So, we have this synapse, we have this neuronal cell that likes to release a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine in this case. And it binds to some kind of target cell. And it binds to Let's say, let's say this is between a um, parasympathetic um, first cell, and let's say it's the second cell in the parasympathetic nervous system. So acetylcholine in, in the first synapse, what's, the, what's that receptor? Nicotinic, okay? So it binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. The distance, what's the, what, what do we call the space between the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell? The this, this, this whole thing is the synapse. We call this the synaptic cleft. Okay? The entire thing, the terminal, the space, and the, the postsynaptic membrane, that the whole thing is the synapse. And then the space between it, we call the synaptic cleft. Every synapse in our body, every single synapse, regulates how much neurotransmitter is allowed to occupy the synaptic cleft. Because we don't want overstimulation of the postsynaptic receptor. Okay. For cholinergic synapses, the way that is done is whenever acetylcholine is released, Choline esterase, okay, I'm going to call it ACHE, is also released. And what that does is it goes in and it digests and inactivates some of the acetylcholine that gets released. Okay. It helps to regulate how much acetylcholine is allowed to occupy the cleft. Because if too much acetylcholine is allowed to occupy the cleft, you can have overstimulation of the postsynaptic cell. Okay. And in the context of, let's say, muscle contraction, if this, if this second cell was a muscle, if we overstimulate a muscle, okay, it goes into what's called tetanus, where it stops contracting. And it's, and it's no longer capable of responding to the um, to acetylcholine, and it's not able to um, contract. Okay. So choline esterase, acetylcholine esterase, it's an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. It's designed to regulate the amount that's allowed to occupy the cleft in order to prevent overstimulation of the postsynaptic cell. We'll see, time and time again, other synapses employing slightly different um, ways of regulating how much neurotransmitter is allowed to occupy the cleft. Okay? A major class of antidepressants, right? What's the most common class of antidepressants? SSRIs. SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Okay? That refers to, just for a brief jaunt, in that direction. Oh, still the synaptic cleft. 
So serotonin, in this case, is released into the synaptic cleft, binds to the serotonin receptor. Okay? On the presynaptic membrane, we have these transporters. Okay? And what they are are serotonin reuptake transporters which means that as serotonin is getting released and enters the cleft, any that diffuses back is going to get taken back up by the cell. Okay? That way it maintains um, a controlled level of uh, neurotransmitter in the cleft. So if you take an SSRI and you block this, What's the effect in terms of the amount of tran transmitter allowed in the cleft? Increase, right? So it allows for more serotonin in the cleft, and it helps in situations where the problem is not enough serotonin stimulation of the postsynaptic cell. So every synapse involves some regulation of how much neurotransmitter is allowed in the cleft. So these choline esterase inhibitors. So if choline esterase inactivates acetylcholine and we block that, then which drug is it most similar to? An acetylcholine agonist or antagonist? If you block digestion of acetylcholine, the net result is more acetylcholine. So if you block digestion of acetylcholine, if you're blocking this enzyme, it, the response is actually more acetylcholine. It, it's, it acts similar in a similar direction as an agonist. Okay? And then we'll also talk about nicotinic drugs that all fall into this col the cholinergic cascade. And then um, starting next, next week, we'll do We'll talk about the added energy drugs. I saw at least one hand around here somewhere. Yeah. Um, wouldn't it be easier, though, for the body to just regulate the acetylcholine instead of also then like, taking the like, Why is it doing that? So it does both, okay? Um, and it, it, it regulates how much acetylcholine gets released, and it regulates how much can occupy the cleft. And uh, between the two, you get this very well controlled um, control over acetylcholine. The other thing you don't want to do is allow for spillover outside of the cleft so that nearby cells accidentally get stimulated or things like that. Um, so one of the things we're going to talk about is that we, we actually put it, we actually give um, these agonists, these cholinergic agonists, because you actually can't just put give somebody acetylcholine because you have low levels of acetylcholine esterase in your blood all the time. Okay? So if you give somebody acetylcholine, acetylcholine won't, even if you infuse it, it won't make it, not enough of it will make it to the receptors. Okay? Because acetylcholine is, is a ubiquitous uh, neurotransmitter and too much of it is um, dangerous in the body, We've got a lot of this enzyme that breaks it down so that we don't have spillover. Yes, sir. So, in the example you gave with the SSRI, yeah. if you're blocking the reuptake of it, do you end up having um, receptor down regulation? Um, do you, in the case of SSRIs, do you have receptor down regulation? So, that is the thought, which is one of the things. It, for ins in many people, the effectiveness of SSRIs tends to be short-lived. So um, SSRIs are actually designed to be given in, in these courses of a maximum of six months um, for that exact reason, that their effectiveness tends to go down anyway. Um, and a period of moving off of them helps reset the whole system. Um, but yes, so that's one of the things that can happen when you change things like that. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
It's a transporter. That it's the reuptake transporter. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that's the, that's the idea. No, so the serotonin that gets um, taken up again is, is recycled or it's broken down, but there's constant manufacturing of new serotonin by the, by the cell. It's not a problem. Yeah. Okay. So talking about cholinergic drugs, let's take a look at, for a second, these cholinergic uh, receptors that these drugs could be working on. We've got nicotinic receptors, okay. N1, N2. N1, if you remember, were found on skeletal muscle and um, caused muscle contraction when acetylcholine um, bound to them. N2 receptors are, on, are found in the autonomic nervous system in both the parasympathetic and sympathetic system. Okay. So the N2 receptors are found in both. The muscarinic receptors, there's actually at the very least three well-identified um, subtypes of the muscarinic receptor. Um, there's actually more than that, but there's three that um, are worth mentioning. So the M1 is mostly found in the central nervous system, not a part of the autonomic nervous system at all. Okay. The M1 receptor that can bind to acetylcholine is found in the central nervous system, not part of the autonomic nervous system at all. Why I mention it is because drugs, there's no such thing as an ideal drug. There's no such thing as a completely selective drug. So if you are giving a muscarinic agonist with your goal of stimulating an M2 or an M3, you may still end up stimulating an M1. And that could be a source of side effects. Okay. So found in the central nervous system. And associated with actually a wide variety of, of central nervous system functions. The acetylcholine system in the brain is our least understood this, uh, neurotransmitter system in the brain. M2 receptor, mostly found on the heart, can be um, can cause things like re uh, reduced heart rate, okay, um, decreases heart rate. Also found on smooth muscle. Okay, when stimulated, causes vasodilation. So smooth muscle of <laughs> blood vessels that are found in the heart, blood vessels that are found in the general circulation. Here's the catch, though. We don't actually understand why we have so many M2 receptors throughout the um, blood vessels of the body. Because we don't actually have parasympathetic nerves contacting those M2 receptors in blood vessels. Okay. They're there. There aren't any parasympathetic nerves leading to them. There are some in the heart, but not in the general circulation. And any acetylcholine that gets into general circulation is going to be quickly digested by acetylcholine esterase. Okay. But they're significant pharmacologically because M2 agonists, most of them are resistant to choline esterase, will stimulate those receptors. It's like God put them there thinking eventually these people are going to develop drugs <laughs> and maybe they'll come in handy. All right. Yeah, so the M2 receptors, they are found on blood vessels in the heart and in, in blood vessels throughout the body. But in the blood vessels, particularly throughout the body, 
there are no parasympathetic nerves making contact there. So they're not releasing acetylcholine to stimulate them. And if you happen to have acetylcholine in the body, it's going to get broken down before it can reach those receptors too. Okay. But many of our cholinergic agonists, those drugs, they don't get broken down by choline esterase. And so they will act on those receptors. Yeah. Those receptors, do you just kind of like take them out there? Do you even know the purpose of them or how far the drug is taking you to take them? That's right. They're hanging out there. We don't know why they're there. That we don't know why, endogenously speaking, like the, na the natural purpose of them. We don't really understand why they're there. The um, general circulation is not innervated parasympathetically by and large at all. And the reason, um, the way that we get vasodilation is either active vasodilation by um, the binding of norepinephrine or epinephrine to beta receptors, or there are hormones that can act on other receptors that can cause dilation. Okay? Um, there are um, there's a lot of auto-regulation of blood vessels. So blood vessels actually can regulate their own at, at a local level, they regulate their own. There's lots of different pathways to vasodilation, but parasympathetically, globally, not really. I could, I could make up a reason, but I, I don't. God made it that way, I don't know. Yeah. Um, M2, uh, excuse me, M3. M3 receptors we find on glands, so exocrine glands, endocrine glands. We find them on smooth muscle associated with um, visceral organs. So, so structures like the bladder, the GI tract, smooth muscle associated with those organs, we see M3 receptors. Okay. When we talk about muscarinic, agonists or antagonists, there's a lot of promiscuity, receptor promiscuity, okay? Meaning that these drugs can agonize or antagonize. We may want them to be very selective to M3, but they may be kind of promiscuous. They may hang out with M2 and M1, all right? And it's these other, it's the relative non-selectivity of these drugs that are going to be the source of a lot of um, adverse effects, side effects. Okay. So just keeping in mind what the effect, the natural stimulation of these receptors are by system. So when acetylcholine binds to these, to these receptors in these different parts of the body, um, in the cardiovascular system, we get vasodilation, we get decreased heart rate, decreased force of contraction of the heart. Um, respiratory tract, we get bronchoconstriction, okay? We get um, increased airway secretion, okay? So the, the parasympathetic nervous system, you get more secretions, okay? Urinary tract, we get bladder contraction, which promotes voiding, promotes urination. So the parasympathetic nervous system promotes um, the emptying of the bladder. GI tract, you get increased motility, increased secretion. Rest and digest, right? So it promotes movement through the GI tract, it promotes digestion. And then other um, increased secretion kind of across the board. So lacrimal means tears, right? So the lacrimal glands in your eyes. So increased tear production, nasopharyngeal, more phlegmy kind of nose and, and pharynx, salivary secretion, right? Enhanced all of those secretions. And then pupillary constriction, also called meiosis, which is, right, the constriction of the pupil. Um, when you're pupils narrow, that, that is very good for near vision, okay? And when your pupils dilate, 
It's very bad for near vision, but it's better for, for long distance vision. Okay. Um, so parasympathetic nervous system, we get these constricted pupils and uh, a combination of, of near vision. And when pupils dilate, um, you tend to feel like your vision is blurry and your pupils are big because they're allowing a lot of light through. Okay, so talk about these agonists. Now, one thing that is a pattern in terms of how we will talk about drugs and how it is best to think about drugs is for every drug, <coughs> excuse me, every drug will have um, a class, right, that matches its mechanism of action. So every drug will have a class that matches its, its mechanism of action. Okay, so these are muscarinic receptor agonists. These are, this is the class of drug that we're talking about. And within every class, there's going to be at least one or two drugs that we describe as being prototypic drugs. meaning being very typical of drugs that occupy this class. So for every drug class, you're going to be asked to really fully commit to memory at least one or two prototypic drugs. And then once you really have a good memory of the characteristics of these one or two prototypic drugs, many of the same characteristics apply to every other drug in that class. Okay. And the advantage of understanding drugs that way is when you look at a drug that sounds like alphabet soup or looks like alphabet soup in the, in the clinic, and you look up the drug, and the first thing you see is drug class, you already know at least half of the information about that drug. Okay? Because most drugs in a class will behave very similarly. Okay? Particularly if you know a lot about at least one prototypic drug. It's gonna, there's gonna, and oftentimes, the, um, the only thing that's mentioned with the non-prototypic drugs is what's different about it. Okay? So for this drug class, muscarinic receptor agonists, our prototypic drug is the thanacol. Thanacol with a little star next to it. So here's acetylcholine. Okay. Please be expected to um, draw out the structure of acetylcholine on the next test. I'm, ki I'm kidding. <laughs> Come on, guys. just to note, for most of the drugs in this class, how similar they are in structure to acetylcholine, okay? Um, and generally speaking, the ones that are less similar are, um, they tend to be uh, farther out in terms of generation, okay? Now, one thing to notice, so susceptibility to choline esterase. So acetylcholine, obviously, is the endogenous neurotransmitter, highly susceptible to choline esterase. The rest of them, by and large, not at all. Okay? So they will act on their targets, uh, target receptors, and they are not going to get digested by acetylcholine esterase. And different drugs will have different um, intrinsic activity at different um, uh, organ systems, which of course relate to the subtype of muscarinic receptor that they're acting. So um, for bethanicol, 
it has really modest cardiovascular effects, um, intense GI effects, intense effects at the urinary bladder, um, uh, good effects at the eye. Okay? Now, what that means is, if somebody remember what um, receptor, muscarinic receptor subtype that matched <coughs> these organs? <coughs> M3, yeah. So the Thanacol is a, is got a little more selectivity to M3 receptors, bless you, than some of these other ones, right? Muscarin uh, acts a little bit more in the cardiovascular system, methanocholine, okay? Uh, but many of these are, have particularly high um, activity at the M3. So the Thanacol, pilocarpine, you'll also see in the, in the slides as we go through. Um, antagonism of atropine, we're gonna talk about atropine. Atropine is a, a cholinergic antagonist. So basically what that means is it's kind of weird to think of something being an antagonist to an antagonist. And what, what's probably more helpful to think of it as um, its ability to reverse the effects of atropine, right? Its ability to reverse the effects of um, the agonist, no, excuse me, the antagonist, okay? And then um, nicotinic activity refers to how much kind of crosstalk or promiscuity this, this drug has uh, at the nicotinic receptor, right? They're muscarinic drugs, but some of them, particularly the first three, um, have some, some activity at the nicotinic receptor as well. So where do we, why do we use muscarinic agonists? What are some of the um, um, characteristics of them? So um, generally speaking, they tend to affect things like the heart and they will tend to reduce heart rate, right? So um, another term for muscarinic agonists that you'll see are parasympathetic mimetics, right? Meaning they mimic, mimetics, they mimic the effects of the parasympathetic system. Okay? So they will cause a reduction in heart rate or bradycardia at exocrine glands, they increase secretion, right? So increase sweating, increase salivation, increase bronchiolar secretion, right? Increase gastric acid secretion. In smooth muscle, they will tend to cause constriction, right? Um, or dilation, depending on uh, what structure you're talking about. So tend to cause constriction in the lungs, right? So bronchiolar constriction. They tend to cause increased um, contractility and tone of the GI tract, so things move through more quickly. <coughs> they tend to cause contraction of the bladder, right? To promote voiding. In the vasculature, they will tend to cause relaxation, vasodilation and a decrease in heart and blood pressure, okay? So in the vasculature, in the blood, blood vessels, they are acting on those M2 receptors, right, that don't normally get stimulated. And they're causing these, these um, decrease in heart rate uh, and vasodilation. In the eye, they're causing pupillary constriction meiosis, okay. So toxicology of muscarinic agonists, where we see um, people ingesting too much of a muscarinic agonist in, in sort of natural phenomenon, there are certain mushrooms that um, uh, have one of the active ingredients in certain mushrooms are uh, muscarinic agonists. Um, so poisoning, eating mushrooms that are, that are toxic, um, we'll, you'll see some of the same effects as too much muscarinic um, agonism, right? So heart rate will go down, pupils will be constricted, right? Um, the blood pressure will go down. It can be really life-threatening. Okay. And they also, um, it also includes uh, 
drugs that act as choline esterase inhibitors. Choline esterase inhibitors, those drugs, um, will have similar effects, including negative and adverse effects, as the muscarinic agonists, because right? they increase the availability of acetylcholine. So some symptoms, early symptoms of toxicity, profuse salivation, um, profuse tearing of the eyes, visual disturbances, okay? bronchospasm, diarrhea, bradycardia, hypotension, okay? possible cardiovascular collapse, meaning the heart can't actually pump enough blood out into the system and the, cardi and the vascular system can't maintain a blood pressure in profuse organs. So treatment, atropine. Atropine is a muscarinic antagonist, right? And then other supportive therapy to um, improve, uh, particularly improve perfusion. So the Thanacol is our prototypic drug. Um, it, ha it is a parasympathetic mimetic agent, right? Mimics the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. It will cause bradycardia. It can cause constriction of the bronchiolar airways. It can increase the tone and motility of the GI system. In the bladder, it will tend to cause um, contraction of the detrusor muscle um, and relaxation of the sphincter. So it, in the process of voiding, two things have to happen. Your bladder has to contract and then the, the sphincter um, allowing urine to leave the bladder has to relax. Okay. And that both of those things um, are the natural effect of acetylcholine and parasympathetic stimulation. Um, in exocrine glands, you get increased sweating, salivation, bronchiolar, all the ones that I mentioned, and constriction of the pupils. So the Thanacol really does it all in terms of um, activating its primary therapeutic uses is in treating urinary retention. Okay? So tr when people have trouble voiding, um, have too much urinary retention, the Thanacol helps um, contract the bladder and promote voiding. Um, it's got some investigational GI uses, so potentially for a low motility of the gut and, and reduced gastric acid production and things like that. It's, it's being investigated in terms of its application in, um, in the GI system. Okay. And then many of the adverse effects, uh, we talked about some of them, including hypotension, um, exacerbation of asthma. So, so asthmatics is going to be pretty, pretty contraindicated. Okay. Muscarinic agonists are not going to be um, used with um, people with a history of asthma. And patients with dysrhythmias, uh, particularly those that can come along with hyperthyroidism, you, you will not likely use muscarinic agonists because it can worsen that dysrhythmia. Pilocarpine, also within this class of drug, has some similar effects. It's used to treat a condition um, called uh, xerostomia, which is sort of extreme dry mouth, very um, reduced uh, production of particularly salivary production. Um, and it's associated with um, head and neck radiation treatments uh, in the course of treating certain head and neck cancers. <coughs> Excuse me. There's also a condition called um, Sogren syndrome that um, involves actually the reduced secretion of many exocrine glands, including lacrimal, including salivary. Um, Sojourn, uh, uh, Sojourn syndrome, it's an autoimmune disorder that really damages a lot of these exocrine glands. So pilocarpine helps um, restore the se uh, secretion of these, of these glands in this syndrome. It can also be used topically, so drops, to cause um, uh, meiosis to cause pupillary constriction um, as a treatment um, for glaucoma or to help patients with glaucoma. So the cholinergic agonists have fewer 
um, applications in terms of therapeutic uses than the cholinergic antagonists. They tend to have um, more uses. Um, cholinergic antagonists, particularly muscarinic antagonists, they competitively block the actions of acetylcholine um, and muscarinic receptors. Okay. Most muscarinic receptors are on those structures that are innervated by parasympathetic nerves. Um, Anticholinergic drugs and muscarinic antagonists, sometimes called parasympatholytics. So mimetics mimic, lytics um, interrupt. Okay. So parasympatholytic agents block the natural um, parasympathetic actions, okay. also referred to as muscarinic blockers, and as a, a, a whole as anticholinergic. Anticholinergic drugs, anticholinergic drugs usually refer to drugs that block muscarinic receptors. Okay. And usually assume a fairly low activity at nicotinic receptors. Okay. Because nicotinic, anti-nicotinic effects are going to have much more mixed results since you're going to affect both sympathetic and parasympathetic um, actions on the body. Now, there are drugs that we're going to talk about that are anti-muscarinic, um, are there anti-muscarinic drugs or muscarinic antagonists. But the thing to understand is that there are actually many drugs, many, many, many drugs that have anticholinergic-like effects. Many drug classes that have effects that are similar to anticholinergic um, drugs, things like antihistamines, tricyclic antidepressants, certain antipsychotic drugs, okay? and it, they tend to cause um, some anti-muscarinic actions. They tend to have some side effects that cause um, anti-muscarinic actions. And these are, it's very important to keep these in mind, and there's even a, I posted a, a list This is uh, in the, it's a handout that's in, I found it online um, from a, this particular resource, but it's just an example of groups, classes of drugs that have anticholinergic actions. And the reason is, <coughs> the reason why it's so important to keep these in mind is that if you have patients that are on anti-muscarinic drugs and also on one of these drugs, the anti-muscarinic effects are going to be enhanced. Okay, so that's very important to understand. But also, drugs that have anticholinergic, anti-muscarinic effects can have particularly, um, can particularly exacerbate effects in certain patient populations, particularly the elderly. Okay. And um, anti-muscarinic drugs come very close to being contraindicated in the elderly across the board. And the reason for that is, really goes back to the um, different subtypes of muscarinic receptor, and especially as it relates to muscarinic receptors that are found in the brain. So general, some general side effects that anticholinergic drugs can have include poor coordination, okay, dementia, confusion, and memory problems. Right, so you can imagine someone who's already elderly, um, all of a sudden they start displaying symptoms that look like dementia, right? So that they're very vulnerable to that. Poor coordination, they're going to be very vulnerable to, to injury, right, with, with falls. Dry nose, dry mouth, sore throat, increased body temperature. Anticholinergic drugs, again, with that um, actions on the central nervous system can elevate body temperature. 
causes pupil dilation, which can affect your, your vision, cause blurry vision. Increases heart rate, right? Which increases the workload on the heart. Can cause urinary retention. Okay. And can cause increased intraocular pr pressure, right? Because of that um, pupillary dilation. Okay. And there's actually a common uh, mnemonic. I'm not sure if you can call this a mnemonic, but. This is how they describe it. Um, that describes some of these key um, effects of anticholinergic drugs. Blind is a bat because of the dilated pupils. Red is a beet, right? Vasodilation, flushing. Hot is a hair because of increased body temperature. Dry is a bone because of less secretion. Mad is a hatter because of hallucinations and confusion. Bloated as a toad, <laughs> urinary retention, and decreased muscle tone in the, in the GI tract, and heart runs alone, which is the, tech, the increased heart rate. <coughs> Blind as a bat, red as a beet, hot as a hare, dry as a bone, mad as a hatter, bloated as a toad, and heart runs alone. And a mnemonic is supposed to be easier to remember, but, <laughs> but, uh, but that's that. Yes, sir. <laughs> Guys, I can't hear his question. I can't hear his question. Yes, sir. Um, potentially, so, so, and different side effects, you know? So, so a patient who um, takes a, a muscarinic antagonist um, at a low level, right? A patient who's elderly may display some of these sort of toxicity level effects at much, at these much lower doses. But also, you might see a constellation of manifestations that you wouldn't necessarily see in a younger patient because um, cognitive function is different in the elderly, right? The, their, 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 their physiology is literally more vulnerable in all of these different ways. So you see um, more exaggerated effects and you see more, um, and, and you see more effects than you would normally see. And it's particularly difficult because as you'll see when you look at that handout, um, it's they're huge categories of drugs, right? And and some of them are over the counter medications like Benadryl. So taking Benadryl, all of a sudden this elderly person appears as though they they have Alzheimer's, right? So it's 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 important to, to be aware of these anticholinergic like drugs when you're combining them, or when you're putting someone on a muscarinic agonist when they're already on. One of these other drugs. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just wondering how the difficulty of unpacking how this system is really affected because if something's a muscarinic antagonist, so an anticholinergic drug, I'm confused then how is it not also a nicotinic antagonist? Because the cholinergic receptors are on both the nicotinic and muscarinic. It depends on the drug. So different drugs have different selectivities okay. for subtype receptors. Generally speaking, most of the drugs that we've talked about so far have very little activity at the nicotinic receptor. Okay, so ACH in general isn't going to affect both nicotinic and muscarinic system people. ACH is the endogenous so it will. It's going to affect it equally. But the drugs are not okay, so a the drugs aren't necessarily 
So the drugs are not identical in shape and therefore reactivity with the receptors. They're, they're different chemicals. So acetylcholine um, fits perfectly into all subtypes of the acetylcholine receptor. Um, a, a drug that a drug that has a random structure can bind to the binding site on M2 receptors. Right, I, I understand now. I, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so, so these drugs have anticholinergic-like effects, and it's very important to keep that in mind when you talk about, um, when, when you're talking about these drugs, when you're um, making your notes on these drugs, if, if at all it's mentioned that these drugs have anticholinergic effects, it should be something that's filed away in your brain, okay? Um, because that's an important piece of information, particularly when you're treating um, older patients, which more and more are your um, patients are, are, more patients that you're gonna interact with are going to be um, older and older, right? It's, an age, it's a growing population. So, Prototypic drug in this class of muscarinic antagonists, subclass of anticholinergics, is atropine. Okay. So atropine is our prototypic drug. It's actually naturally occurring. It's produced by all plants in the nightshade family. Okay. And um, plants like eggplant are in the nightshade family. Um, so different plants in that, in that family produce different levels of atropine. Atropine is a muscarinic antagonist. And it's been around for a very long time. One of the early uses of atropine was cosmetically. Um, Cleopatra used to um, put it... Uh, use it as eye drops, so she would have these dilated eyes that would make her look mysterious and beautiful. Um, also make her blind as a bat, but you, know, you gotta suffer for your beauty, I, I guess. Um, and then there was actually a resurgence of the use of, of atropine um, among the, uh, in the Renaissance period among women. Um, it had the name Atropa Belladonna, right, because of beauty. And it was the same thing, that it would dilate their pupils and it would make them look um, you know, they would have to stay put wherever they were, but it would make them look very mysterious and beautiful. Um, but there's also, there were also um, early uses and continued uses of atropine um, in military settings. So it's used as an antidote to nerve gas. Um, nerve gas is um, a chemical weapon used in, in warfare for a long, long time. And the, the main mechanism is different, different types of nerve gases, but all of them um, inhibited choline esterase. Okay. So all of the nerve gases tended to block the effects of acetylcholine esterase. And the primary way that, that, that what that would do to you is it would um, physically paralyze you because all of your muscles would, would um, be overstimulated and go into tetany, so you wouldn't be able to run away, you would be um, immobilized. And then um, at higher doses of nerve gas, it would shut down your diaphragm and you would stop breathing. Okay. So um, in the military world, atropine is put in these auto injectors that at the first sign either you could you administer it to yourself or you could administer to another um, soldier where it would just be um, plunged into the quadricep muscle and given intramuscularly as an antidote to, to nerve gas, right? But um, when, when people took atropine, um, it, it blocks muscarinic receptors, so it's going to have um, all of those effects that we're talking about, right? Pupillary dilation, um, and um, right? it increases heart rates. Um, it will decrease secretions of exocrine glands. <coughs> it relaxes, causes bronchodilation. This is atropine now. Decreases 
muscle tone in the urinary uh, bladder, so we're talking about now promotes urinary retention, it opposes voiding, uh, and decreases muscle tone through the GI tract. It causes uh, the opposite of meiosis or pupillary constriction, which is um, my dry up, my dryasis, okay, which is that um, dilation of the eyes. It has um, some effects in the central nervous system, again through the M1 receptor. Mild excitation um, can include things all the way to uh, hallucinations and delirium, depending on the, on the concentration exposed. So therapeutic uses of atropine, um, primarily actually um, as a pupil dilator, right? So oftentimes atropine, you'll see it medically um, as, as a drop in order to dilate the eyes so that um, in, in the course of ophthalmic uh, examinations, oftentimes you need to dilate the eye. It could also be used um, as a pre-anesthetic medication um, used to treat bradycardia. Okay. It can be used um, to treat intestinal hypermotility or hypertonicity. Okay. It can be um, used to oppose or treat poisoning with a muscarinic agonist. So if somebody consumes um, foreign mushrooms that they thought were fine. I have a whole bunch of friends that like to go mushroom hunting. <laughs> I, they're all, they all live in Portland, Oregon, so. <laughs> um, but, uh, but every once in a while, you know, they, they misidentify, they don't have a great, they're great little guidebooks, but every once in a while they misidentify a mushroom. So one of the things that could be um, done is to give atropine to oppose um, that poisoning. Peptic ulcer disease, since um, peptic ulcers are associated with increased gastric acid production, atropine will lower gastric acid production and help uh, treat that. Um, asthma, by opposing the um, muscarinic receptors, it helps promote bronchodilation. Um, biliary colic, uh, pain in the, in the bile ducts, um, it, because it helps relax those muscles. Okay. Adverse effects um, that uh, serostoma, the dry mouth, right? because it dries you out, anticholinergics dry you out. Um, blurred vision and photophobia because of that um, pupillary dilation. An elevation of intraocular pressure, again because of that dilation of the pupils. Urinary retention, constipation, um, something I forgot the name of. Uh, tachycardia, asthma, okay. So, these, these drugs also have adverse effects. Um, avoid combining atropine with other drugs that can cause muscarinic <coughs> blockade. Um, generally, uh, general systemic therapy is, an, is one preparation. Um, an atropen, which is um, some, that auto injector uh, that I was describing for military uses to oppose the nerve gas, the choline esterase um, inhibitors, um, and op the ophthal ophthalmology, those are the, the drops of atropine to help dilate the pupils. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be that the bronchodilation is short-lived and there's rebound. That's, that would be my guess. Because any any time you stimulate, um, it's similar to that what I was talking about with the inhalers. That any time you stimulate something long term, you take it away. It can actually cause constriction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one um, application for these anticholinergic drugs, particularly these anti-muscarinic drugs. Um, is for the treatment of a condition called overactive bladder. Um, an overactive bladder, also known as urgency, incontinence, um, detrusors, instability, um, or I don't, I've never heard anybody call it this, but can't hold it anymore, incontinence. 
Um, but basically, it's associated with random and frequent muscle spasms of the bladder that cause someone to have to um, urgently um, use the restroom frequently, right? even um, losing bladder, bladder control if, if the spasms are strong enough. So four major symptoms, urinary urgency, urinary frequency, nocturia, which is um, the need to urinate in the middle of the night, not usually something that um, most people do quite often. Um, urge incontinence, um, which is the imminent loss of bladder control because of an imminent um, urgency to urinate. And it's, like I said, involuntary contractions of the detressor muscles. And remembering that the detressor muscles have muscarinic receptors that they cause, that cause constriction or contraction um, when acetylcholine binds to it. And so blocking those receptors can cause relaxation. So it's a major application of these um, anti-muscarinic um, drugs. So, and it's, a, and it's a significant problem. Up to a third of Americans are affected by overactive bladder and develop at any age, but most prominently in older adults. Um, two modes of treatment, behavioral therapy and drug therapy. Um, if therapy is in, ineffective, um, there's nerve stimulation that can be tried, which is the nerve stimulation to oppose. This would be the um, sympathetic nerve innervating the bladder to oppose the spasms. Um, but in terms of drug therapy options, um, muscarinic antagonists are a major class of drugs to be used. There's several drugs that are used for um, uh, the treatment of overactive bladder. Um, oxybutynine, which is going to serve as our uh, prototypic drug for these um, overactive bladder uh, drugs. It's available in a syrup, extended release tablets, and even a transdermal patch and gel. Okay. Um, oxybutynine is the generic name. It has several uh, trade names. In uh, parentheses, acts primarily that the M3 muscarinic receptor, right, which is where you see what that's the receptor you see in, in the bladder. <coughs> it's going to have broad anticholinergic side effects. Um, you, it's going to have drug interactions with that larger category of anticholinergic light drugs, um, and it's going to be available in these different um, forms. Another drug used to treat overactive bladder, um, darifenosin, um, has the greatest degree of M3 selectivity. It can reduce overactive symptoms, right? Having almost no effects at the M1 receptor or M2 receptor in the heart, which is highly um, uh, desirable, right? Particularly for an elderly population that are affected by overactive bladder. If it has no M1 um, effects, that means it's not going to have any of the central nervous system um, problems that some of these other anticholinergic drugs have. It's very well tolerated. It can cause dry mouth and constipation because of that drying out um, and slowing of the, the GI tract motility. Solafenacin. Right, similar to da darifenosin, it's not as selective an M3 antagonist, so you get a little bit more of these other side effects that you see at the M1 and M2, um, but you still see dry mouth, you see some blurred vision as, as adverse effects, but it can also, um, at the M2 receptor in the heart, it can also affect um, the QT interval, it can tend to elongate the QT interval. Tolteridine, um, non-selective muscarinic antagonist, um, fewer anticholinergic side effects, but still um, lengthens the QT. <coughs> Fesoteridine, again, non-selective muscarinic antagonist, um, major side effects are dry mouth and constipation. Um, trospium, 
also non-selective, um, dry mouth constipation. So these are all drugs within this, within this group. Okay. Scopolamine. Scopolamine you will see um, used for, for multiple therapeutic applications, including the one that we're talking about here. Um, has actions very similar to atropine. Um, therapeutic doses of atropine produce mild uh, central nervous system excitation, um, while therapeutic doses of scopolamine tend to produce more sedation. Um, so it, uh, scopolamine is not going to be um, the first drug of choice in, a, in an um, aging population. It, it's used for um, wider applications, including suppressing emesis, so um, as an anti-nausea. So if you're going to see scopolamine in, in applications of things like motion sickness. So this suggests that scopolamine actually has um, more effects in the central nervous system than you would see with atropine, uh, because that suppressing emesis uh, is not something that you see as an effect of atropine. So principal uses include um, treating motion sickness, um, dilating the pupils of the eyes, okay, um, and producing pre-anesthetic sedation um, and obstetric amnesia. So this, it's never used for that anymore. But um, the, back in the day, scopolamine used to be something that women in labor were given um, frequently. And uh, scopolamine does not lessen the pain of childbirth. It just makes you forget the pain <laughs> of childbirth. Um, but it also tended to cause this like hallucinations and delirium. And, um, if you've ever seen the movie, um, The Business of Being Born, have you seen that? So they, they used to tie women down when they gave birth and give them scopolamine. And they, they wouldn't remember a thing, so they couldn't complain about it. Right? Yes, ma'am. Did you notice anything kooky that would go on? Um, yeah, they would have definitely um, some problems with this particular yeah. patient. Yeah. Um, what patient population was this in? ALS. Okay, yeah. Um, so, but that's a situation where the secretions can become a little issue. Yeah. yeah. So twilight sleep was what they call. It's really nice. It sounds a lot better than being like strapped to a bed while you gave birth, you know, and you would never remember it. Um, yeah, twilight sleep is what they would call it. That this state that they would induce during during childbirth. Um, yeah, obstetrics not a good history, terrible history. Um, ipratropium bromine, also an anticholinergic drug used to treat asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, and rhino, uh, rhinitis uh, causes, uh, which are caused by uh, allergies and common cold. So um, the ability to um, uh, dilate the airways uh, were, is being utilized in that application. Right? So inhalation or nasal spray is a common um, route not associated with many anti-muscarinic side effects, uh, but some, like dry mouth, blurred vision, um, some urinary hesitancy and constipation. So these anti-secretory anticholinergics, so these drugs that seem to have um, anticholinergic effects that are, are a little bit more directed at um, uh, blocking uh, production of, of secretions. Dicyclamine, um, indicated for irritable bowel syndrome, uh, spasma spasmatic bowel um, uh, colitis, functional ba bowel disorders like 
uh, diarrhea and hypermotility. So the, um, this muscarinic agonist is particularly good at reducing muscle tone in the, in the bowel, right? and therefore used for, for these um, applications. These mydriatic cycloplegics, these are dr drugs that are used in drop form to cause pupillary dilation. Okay. Um, so atropine, we mentioned, choline. Okay. So these are drugs that are, uh, have particular application um, commonly in eye drop form for causing um, dilation. There are anticholinergic drugs that the goal is actually for them to act centrally. Okay. So there are anticholinergic drugs that the goal is actually for them to act centrally. Um, and some of the applications is in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, I won't get into it, but Parkinson's disease is a motor dysfunction, uh, a disorder of motor dysfunction, um, where the, there's a balance between, uh, in the basal ganglia, there's a balance between um, the cholinergic input and the dopaminergic input in processing motor commands. And in Parkinson's, the dopamine starts to get depleted, so you get this over-dominance of acetylcholine. So the anticholinergic drugs help to create a little bit more balance in those. Um, interestingly, one of the side effects of these centrally acting cholinergic drugs is to actually cause Parkinson's-like symptoms in patients who don't have Parkinson's. So it um, creates a dysregulation of of motor function that actually induces um, side effects that will look like Parkinson's. Okay. But they all act at muscarinic receptors in the central nervous system. Okay. Um, we, we, we mentioned this, the muscarinic uh, agonist in the toxicology. So um, anti-muscarinic poisoning um, uh, can, the toxicology of anti-muscarinic um, drugs uh, cause opposite effects of the um, muscarinic poisoning, right? So dry mouth, blurred vision, photophobia, hyperthermia, central nervous system effects, hot, dry, and flushed skin. Um, treatments are drugs that uh, compete for the muscarinic receptors, so th um, uh, this drug uh, is an agonist of muscarinic receptors. Also, the use of um, inhibitors of acetylcholine esterase in order to oppose the um, effects of those antagonists. Okay. Okay. So, um, last time we started the neuropharmacology section and we talked about the cholinergic drugs, we talked about the muscarinic agonists and muscarinic antagonists. Today we're going to talk about um, a couple of other cholinergic drugs, <coughs> and then we're going to talk about the adrenergic drugs. So the first group of, of cholinergic drugs we're going to talk about um, are drugs uh, called choline esterase inhibitors. So these are not drugs that are acting on a receptor necessarily, okay? Meaning that, excuse me, they're, they're acting on a target, they're acting on, on, on a target in that sense, but they are not acting on the nicotinic or muscarinic receptors, okay? These are drugs that are going to block the activity of choline esterase, okay? Choline esterase was the enzyme that's responsible for breaking down acetylcholine in the synapse. Okay. So when you block the breakdown of acetylcholine in the synapse, you allow for more acetylcholine and more stimulation of the receptors. Okay. So these drugs, choline esterase inhibitors, are going to have similar effects as um, applying an agonist to the receptors that acetylcholine acts on. Okay. So they promote stimulation of the receptors. Um, so they prevent degradation of acetylcholine, 
um, they are viewed as indirect acting choline agonists or cholinergic agonists, okay? Meaning that, that their effect is similar to a cholinergic agonist. They lack selectivity. So they will act on any of the choline esterases at any of the synapses. Okay? So they w um, theoretically can have a muscarinic effect, nicotinic effect, and a neuromuscular effect. Okay? The therapeutic uses for choline esterase inhibitors is fairly narrow. Um, it's limited to the treatment of a disease called myasthenia gravis. Um, and myasthenia gravis, we'll talk more about that in a couple um, slides, but this is an a, um, autoimmune disorder that uh, produces muscle weakness and paralysis. Okay? So it's really a, um, a disease where the acetylcholine receptors, especially the neuromuscular receptor, is um, attacked and degraded. Okay? So choline esterase inhibitors have two basic categories. We have what are called reversible choline esterase inhibitors and irreversible inhibitors. The reversible inhibitors are, um, they are competitive in nature, okay? They, and they have reversible action. They, they have a, um, some have a short um, acting life, some have a longer acting life. The prototypic drug for these reversible choline esterase inhibitors is neostigmine. And neostigmine produces an effect that has a moderate duration. Okay. The irreversible choline esterase inhibitors are generally, um, have very little um, therapeutic use. It can be used to treat glaucoma, but, but mostly they're used as insecticides. They produce a very long duration of action, and they are really highly toxic. Okay, so clinically, we are usually, usually using reversible choline esterase inhibitors. So the three reversible choline esterase inhibitors, the three most common ones, neostigmine, which is our prototypic drug, physostigmine, and edrophonium. Okay, and we'll talk about each one of them. So their primary therapeutic use um, is to treat myasthenia gravis. And myasthenia gravis is characterized by fluctuating muscle weakness and a predisposition to rapid fatigue. Okay? And the most common symptom is what we call ptosis, which is drooping eyelids, and dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, in addition to weakness of skeletal muscles. Now, what's causing myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune process where antibodies, autoantibodies produced by your body, um, attack the nicotinic receptor that's found at the neuromuscular junction okay, and results in a decrease in functional receptors by somewhere between 70 to 90 percent. So choline esterase inhibitors produce symptomatic relief okay, by increasing the availability of acetylcholine at the, neuro, at the neuromuscular junctions that are intact. They can produce some symptomatic relief, but patients um, need to be on the drugs for their entire lives. So when we're using these drugs, this the choline esterase inhibitors, we see some common side effects. Some of the side effects include excessive muscarinic responses. So again, the muscarinic receptors um, per, are part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So what we're looking at here um, when we say excessive muscarinic responses are responses of too much parasympathetic stimulation. Now, atropine can occasionally be given to reverse the side effects um, when we see uh, when we see them. <clears throat> so the dosage adjustments, when, we, when someone is on one of these choline esterase inhibitors, um, there is the period of time where we're trying to individualize their dose and adjust their dose. 
because we want the minimal effective dose. As doses get higher, you get more and more muscarinic and other side effects. Okay? So we want the minimal effective dose. And so it takes some, some trial and error to determine that, that optimal dose for the person. So we're just going to start small and adjust the, adjust the dose based on the patient's response. Okay. You're going to keep track of what their level of, of muscular strength before the administered dose, the time of the administration, okay. the muscle strength after the administrated dose, and how quickly they fatigue, and any signs of muscarinic stimulation. So once a baseline dose is determined based on this trial and error, the patients themselves are going to learn, need to learn how to adjust doses based on certain circumstances. Okay? So they may need to modify their doses based on some kind of anticipated exertion. Okay? If they're going to engage in some physical activity, they may need to adjust their dose. Right? And they look for signs of under-medication which include that eye drooping, ptosis, and difficulty swallowing, the dysphagia. Okay? And also look for signs of over-medication, which are going to be mostly muscarinic responses, like excess salivation, okay? or too much production of too much saliva. There are two major complications when you treat someone um, with myasthenia gravis using a, colon or a choline esterase inhibitor. There are two major complications. Um, one complication is what's called cholinergic crisis, which is really a problem of too much drug. Okay? And the other is something called myasthenic crisis, which is really a problem of not enough drug. Now the problem with differentiating between these two complications is that they look the same. Okay? When someone is in a myasthenic crisis and they're not um, adequately treated with their drug, they will exhibit um, extreme muscle weakness, okay, pr uh, muscle paralysis, the eye drooping, the difficulty swallowing. <clears throat> and it's really caused by an insufficient acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. And if left untreated, myasthenia myasthenic crisis can result in death um, because of paralysis of the respiratory muscles. Okay. Now the treatment for myasthenic crisis is the use of one of these choline esterase inhibitors, right, like neostigmine. It can relieve the crisis and stabilize the person. Cholinergic crisis, on the other hand, applying too much drug Applying too much drug results in overstimulation of muscle and tetany. And when a muscle is in tetany, it, can, it is too stimulated and no longer responds. Okay. So the cholinergic crisis is also characterized by extreme muscle weakness and paralysis okay, and signs of excessive muscarinic stimulation. Now, there is, so the treatment of cholinergic crisis is supporting respiratory um, function and, and the use of atropine. Right. So how do we decide which one someone is in? Okay. If, they're, if, you, if you know very little about their patient history or, or their um, drug history, how do you decide which one is in? Well, so there's, there's a technique um, called a challenge test um, used to distinguish between cholinergic crisis and myasthenia gravis. Um, and it's the um, application of a dose of what's called edrophonium. Edrophonium is an ultra short acting choline esterase inhibitor. Okay. It's an ultra short acting choline esterase inhibitor. So when you give edrophonium to a patient that's presenting with muscle weakness and paralysis, okay, if the patient gets better 
during that brief um, time where the drug is acting, which, which condition do they have? Myasthenic crisis. Okay. If their symptoms improve, then they are in myasthenic crisis. If their symptoms don't improve or worsen, they're in cholinergic crisis. So it's a way to briefly um, see what the effect of a cholinesterase inhibitor is on this person and therefore um, distinguish between these two complications and, and apply the appropriate treatment. Yes. No, no. Um, when, when someone's in cholinergic crisis and the muscle is in tetany, it, there's a period of time where there's contraction and then it's followed by just paralysis. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look, closer look at these reversible cholinesterase inhibitors. So neostigmine is the prototypic um, drug. At therapeutic doses, they tend to primarily affect muscarinic receptors and neuromuscular junction. Okay. So cholinesterase inhibitors um, at therapeutic doses have little to no nicotinic effects in terms of the um, autonomic nicotinic receptors or um, effects on the central nervous system. Toxic levels of neostigmine can depress CNS function, especially respiration, and um, it's administered orally or via an intramuscular injection. It has really poor oral um, absorption because it's uh, highly charged, and it's contraindicated in patients taking what's called a succinylcholine, which is a neuromuscular uh, junction blocker because in patients taking succinylcholine, it can intensify the paralysis. Uh, precautions and contraindications. If a patient has obstruction of the GI tract or the urinary tract, you, you don't want to give them one of these drugs. Um, in the case of peptic ulcer disease, asthma, coronary insufficiency, hyperthyroidism. Okay. And this is mostly because of the muscarinic uh, the possibility for muscarinic effects when you when you apply a cholinesterase inhibitor. Okay, it worsens these conditions. Other reversible cholinesterase inhibitors, physostigmine, um, which is the drug of choice for treating poisoning by atropine and other muscarinic blockers. Okay. It can also treat um, the excess anticholinergic effects of um, the use of drugs like antihistamines okay, and certain antipsychotics. And the drug is uncharged, so it can cross the blood-brain barrier. Okay, so we talked last time about patients taking, um, taking multiple drugs that have anticholinergic effects and having that constellation of symptoms. Um, physostigmine is the drug of choice for reversing those effects. Ambenium and edrophonium and pyrostigmine, these are other reversible cholinergic um, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors. And then there are some that are used to treat Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Questions about the neuromuscular blockers? Yes, ma'am. Succinylcholine stimulates the release of, of potassium from, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you, whenever the skeletal muscle depolarizes, it involves the movement of sodium into the cell and the movement of potassium out of the cell. And so succinylcholine will naturally cause potassium to exit cells. Okay. Okay. All right. Adrenergic agonists. So we're into now the adrenergic drugs. And the adrenergic drugs are the drugs that um, 
include drugs similar to dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. Okay. These are the catecholamines, uh, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. Okay. And they bind to a variety of adrenergic receptors. Alpha adrenergic receptors, beta adrenergic receptors, and then dopamine receptors are also considered adrenergic receptors. Okay. The adrenergic drugs are going to, um, if it's an, depending on whether it's uh, an agonist or an antagonist, they're either going to block or stimulate sympathetic um, effects on the body. Okay. So adrenergic agonists produce their effects by activating adrenergic receptors. And so we call these drugs um, sympathomimetic, mimicking sympathetic effects on the body. And they have really broad spectrum applications. We, we use these drugs in a, in a wide variety of um, purposes. Congestive heart failure and other um, heart disease and cardiovascular diseases, uh, asthma, uh, preterm labor. Okay, just to name a few. So the, there's a couple of different mechanisms for adrenergic receptor activation for these drugs. The most um, straightforward are the drugs that cause direct receptor binding. Okay, and, and this is, most of these drugs act this way. They um, mimic the effects of the drugs by binding to the receptors and activating them which includes exogenous administration of catecholamines that we see in the body, okay? or applying drugs that are basically the same um, as the, the endogenous ligand. So treatment with dopamine, epinephrine, isoproteranol, and a drug called ephedrine. Another mechanism of receptor activation includes enhancing norepinephrine release. Okay. So instead of agonizing the receptor, it enhances the release of norepinephrine at the synapse. Okay. And so drugs that act this way include amphetamines, ephedrine. Okay, so notice that ephedrine is acting through multiple mechanisms. Okay. Another mechanism is inhibition of norepinephrine reuptake. Okay, inhibition of norepinephrine reuptake. Tricyclic antidepressants act this way. Cocaine act, acts this way. Okay. Um, and then inhibition of norepinephrine inactivation. So the, um, an example of this are MAO inhibitors. So MAO, which stands for monoamine oxidase, is the enzyme, monoamine oxidase, is the enzyme that digests the catecholamines and uh, breaks them down. So drugs like MAO inhibitors will block that degradation and extend the life of norepinephrine. Yes? Yeah, it's, it's going to have a similar, um, it's a similar mechanism by yeah, blocking the digestion of the neurotransmitter. Okay, so adrenergic receptors fall under two major categories, alpha receptors and beta receptors. And then under each category, we have alpha 1, alpha 2, uh, uh, beta 1, beta 2. Okay. Alpha 1 receptors, um, and you can see underneath it, it says postsynaptic receptors, meaning that they are on, um, the, cell, they are on the cell being stimulated. Alpha-2 receptors are presynaptic. They are actually on the cell releasing norepinephrine. Okay. Now, the alpha-2 receptors, if you recall when I talked about choline esterase, I said that every synapse regulates how much neurotransmitter can occupy the cleft. Right? And it does this by these synapses do this by a variety of mechanisms. Adrenergic receptors 
the alpha receptors, excuse me, adrenergic synapses, the alpha synapses, will have, so here's the neuron presynaptic cell, and this is the postsynaptic cell. The presynaptic cell releases norepinephrine, and it'll bind to, let's say, an alpha-1 on the postsynaptic cell. The presynaptic cell contains alpha-2 receptors, so when norepinephrine binds to that receptor, it actually inhibits the release of more, more norepinephrine. Okay? So presynaptic cell releases norepinephrine to act on the postsynaptic cell. Alpha-2 receptors are found on the cell releasing it so that when norepinephrine binds to that presynaptic receptor, it reduces norepinephrine release. Okay? This is another mechanism to regulate the amount of neurotransmitter allowed to occupy the synaptic cleft. Okay? I saw a hand. What was, what, what was your question? Okay. Yes, sir. It's, it's similar to what you're talking about, only in that it helps prevent overstimulation of the postsynaptic cell. Yeah. Okay? So by, by controlling how much norepinephrine can occupy the synapse, you're helping to prevent overstimulation of the postsynaptic cell. Okay? Because like we saw with... Um, the cholinergic receptors, when you overstimulate the skeletal muscle, it can no longer respond. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. So norepinephrine released from the cell can bind to alpha-1 or alpha-2. When it binds to alpha-1, it stimulates the cell. When it binds to alpha-2, it decreases the release of norepinephrine. Okay? So if, if there's a drug that blocks alpha-2 receptors, will that tend to enhance or block the stimulation of alpha-1? Enhance. enhance. Right? Enhance. So alpha-2 receptors are similar in effect to the choline esterase inhibitors. Right? They enhance stimulation at the, sy at the synapse. Okay? Good. And then the beta receptors, um, both beta-1 and beta-2 are both postsynaptic. So there's only one presynaptic receptor that um, we're talking about in the adrenergic receptors, and that's alpha-2. Okay. So alpha-1 receptors, where do we see alpha-1 receptors? We see alpha-1 receptors, one of the, we see alpha-1 receptors on smooth muscle. Okay. That's a major place where we see alpha-1 receptors. And when you stimulate an alpha-1 receptor, it causes contraction of smooth muscle. Okay? Um, so blood vessels that are innervate, that are perfusing, rather, the skin, the GI tract, the kidney, cross out brain. If you have a copy of this slide, cross out brain. Okay, I actually got this. Um, I didn't make this chart myself, 
um, and I notice that this, this is a mistake. There, you can't constrict vessels perfusing the brain. The brain will not allow it, okay? The, the brain is the head honcho, and he, he, it, it doesn't dilate or constrict. It takes whatever blood it needs. It doesn't need a whole lot, but it, you cannot reduce perfusion to the brain through uh, constriction in a classic way, okay? Um, and then smooth muscle of the ureters, of the vas deferens, of the urethral sphincter, of the uterus, of the ciliary body, okay, um, which is the uh, causing constriction of the pupils, okay. And then glucose metabolism, um, stimulation of alpha-1 receptors enhances the production of glucose and the breakdown of stored glucose. Alpha-2 receptors, um, you see it uh, pretty much wherever you see a, um, a norepinephrine uh, releasing onto alpha-1. And then beta-1 receptors, you find predominantly in the heart. Okay? And in the heart, it elevates heart rate. Um, it enhances contractility which has the nice effect of enhancing ejection fraction. You also see beta-1 receptors um, in the kidneys enhancing renin release. Okay. Beta-2 receptors, what some of the important places where we see beta-2 receptors is on smooth muscle of the airways. Okay. So we see bronchiolar dilation. Um, relaxation of the detrusor muscles, which is the uh, muscles aligning the bladder, okay, and the uterine muscle. Okay. So beta-2 receptors found on the uterine muscle cause um, uterine muscle relaxation. Okay. And so one of the uses we're going to talk about <coughs> of these adrenergic agonists are beta-2 um, adrenergic agonists to prevent preterm labor to promote the relaxation of the uterus um, so that the baby doesn't, uh, isn't born too early, or the uter uh, fetus, rather, isn't born too early. Okay. So alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. These are the adrenergic receptors that we're going to be talking about. And then we have lots of different types of adrenergic agonists, and they tend to fall under two categories. They tend to fall under catecholamines, okay, um, which includes norepinephrine, epinephrine, isoproteranol, dopamine, and dobutamine. And what makes catecholamines um, different from the non-catecholamines is they cannot be taken orally. They cannot be taken orally because they are highly susceptible to degradation from um, MAO, MAOs and COMT, excuse me, COMT. These are the two enzymes that naturally break down catecholamines, and so not enough, if taken orally, not enough will get to the target site. They tend to have brief duration of actions, and they cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So these drugs are usually given parenterally, okay, especially um, IV or IM. They have a brief duration of action, and they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. The non-catecholamines, which include um, ephedrine, phenylephrine, terbutaline, these can be given orally. Okay, they can be given orally. They, are, they have a longer half-life. They, they get metabolized much uh, more slowly the, by the MA, MAOs compared to the catecholamines. And they have a greater ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. Okay. So depending on the, on the desired effect and the situation, a catecholamine versus a non-catecholamine might be um, uh, optimal. So of these adrenergic drugs, um, they have different specificity for the different adrenergic receptors. 
Okay. Epinephrine acts on alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. Ephedrine acts on the same um, receptors as epinephrine. Norepinephrine acts predominantly on alpha-1, alpha-2, and beta-1. Phenylephrine has a predominantly alpha-1 effect. Isoproparanol has a mostly beta effect, beta-1 and beta-2. Dopamine acts on alpha-1, the beta receptors, and the dopaminergic receptors. Dobutamine has primarily a beta-1 effect, and tubertuline has primarily a beta-2 effect. So therapeutic applications of um, and adverse effects of adrenergic receptor um, activation. So when we stimulate alpha-1 receptors, um, some of the th therapeutic effects that we get include um, enhancement of hemostasis. So we get vasoconstriction of blood vessels that helps stop bleeding. So we, we help reduce um, bleeding uh, by stimulating alpha-1 receptors. Nasal decongestion. Okay, phenylephrine is something that you see in, in uh, nasal decongestants, right? Because it, re it causes um, constriction of vessels in the nose and reduces mucosal production. Alpha-1 agonists, especially epinephrine, um, are often used along with local anesthetics because by constricting local blood vessels, it reduces the diffusion of the anesthetic away from the site and helps um, delay absorption and, enhance and um, increase the... Um, increase the effect of that local anesthesia. Okay. Elevation of blood pressure, right? We cause vasoconstriction systemically and it elevates blood pressure. Um, Mydriasis, my, my or dilation of the muscles of the iris, okay? Pup pupillary dilation. And the drugs that are capable of activating alpha-1 receptors include epinephrine, norepinephrine, phenyledrin, and dopamine. Okay. And we use these different drugs depending on um, the situation, right? So um, phenylephrine, I mentioned, is used as a nasal decongestant. Okay. Um, how are we taking those nasal decongestants? What's the route of administration? Oral, right? We're taking the pill. You can go any over-the-counter medications about phenylephrine as a nasal decongestant, which tells you what in terms of whether it's a catecholamine or a non-catecholamine. Non-catecholamine. Good. Clinical consequences of alpha-2 activation. If we're activating alpha-2 receptors, right, are we stimulating those adrenergic synapses or inhibiting? Remember, the alpha-2 is the presynaptic, right? If we're stimulating the alpha-2, then we're causing less release of norepinephrine, right? Which ends up actually inhibiting those adrenergic, uh, adrenergic synapses, okay? So the consequence is actually a reduction of sympathetic outflow to the heart and blood vessels and it has an antihypertensive effect, okay? Um, and another effect that's um, fairly recent in its discovery, but also um, more and more, used more and more in recent years, um, is the relief of severe pain, okay? So, uh, and this is when these alpha-2 agonists are actually applied intrathecally, right? In the, in the spinal cord um, to treat severe pain. An example of a drug like this is clonidine. Okay. And it is unclear why this works. Okay. It's still unclear why stimulating alpha-2 um, receptors in the spinal cord can, can help treat severe pain, but it does work. 
beta-1 activation. And so beta-1 receptors we find predominantly in the heart. Stimulating beta-1 activation, um, the, the main, when we are giving a beta-1 agonist, our target is the heart. Okay, so therapeutically, beta-1 agonists are targeting the heart. And um, the effects on the heart are going to be sympathomimetic, right? We're going to increase heart rate, increase contractility, right? help increase ejection fraction and cardiac output. So beta-1 receptors can be activated by epinephrine, norepinephrine, isoproterenol, dopamine, dobutamine, and ephedrine. And therapeutic applications of beta-1 activation, shock. Okay, so when somebody's blood pressure is crashing because they're in shock, we can help um, support their blood pressure through beta-1 activation. Um, profound hypotension will reduce tissue perfusion, okay, um, which is what we see in shock. If your blood pressure gets too low, you can't perfuse your organs, and your organs start to um, fail. So our primary goal is to maintain blood flow to vital organs. Um, beta-1 stimulation increases heart rate and force of contraction and increases cardiac output, which improves tissue perfusion. Okay. Another therapeutic application of beta-1 activation is heart failure. Activation of beta-1 receptors in the heart is what we call a positive inotrope, which means it enhances car, uh, force of contractility, which helps improve cardiac performance. Okay. Now, uh, using a beta-1 um, agonist in a patient with heart failure, only some patients with heart failure are going to be well enough to get a beta-1 um, agonist. Okay. And then some patients with heart failure are actually going to get beta blockers, beta-1 receptor blockers. Okay. It really depends um, on the severity of their heart failure and whether or not the heart can actually tolerate um, uh, contracting harder. Because if the heart contracts harder, okay, it increases its workload and it needs more oxygen and blood for that performance, okay? And patients with heart failure often have impaired ability to supply the heart with enough blood. Okay. Beta-1 activation is also used to treat AV heart block. So the heart um, has these autorhythmic cells, these cells that maintain heart, heart rate um, the first group of cells are in what we call the SA node, and then the next group of cells are at the very center of the heart called the AV node. Okay. And stimulation of the AV node is necessary for um, the stimulation of the ventricles okay, and ventricular contraction. So some individuals have um, a heart block where the tissue in around the AV node and including the AV node has maybe died as a result of heart attack or been impaired because of myocardial infarction or heart disease. And so you can't propagate um, the action potential at the, at the AV node. So beta-1 activation can help stimulate the AV node and treat AV nodal heart block. So the drugs are really only a temporary form of treatment, but so the long-term management, it's really a bridge to insertion of a pacemaker that can initiate the action potential at the AV node um, in a sustained long-term way. Beta-1 activation um, using epinephrine is Epinephrine is really the drug of choice for, um, or at least the first line drug in treating cardiac arrest, okay, in terms of acute resuscitation. So when someone's heart stops and 
a code is called, right? Um, you're going to, it's going to initiate um, uh, acute resuscitation. And part of the protocol for acute resuscitation is IV administration of epinephrine, okay? which activates cardiac beta receptors, which can help initiate contraction of the heart um, even after it's stopped. But the drugs are really not, um, are never really applied alone. They're not the solitary treatment or even the preferred treatment for cardiac arrest. Initial management focuses on cardiopulmonary resuscitation, external pace pacing, or defibrillation, depending on the underlying cause. Okay? But the epinephrine is going to be the first line drug used in, um, in a code. Adverse effects of using a beta-1 um, uh, and, uh, agonist uh, dysrhythmias. Because beta-1 drugs target the heart um, and stimulate uh, conduction of the heart um, cells, it can also cause dysrhythmias. It can also cause angina pectoralis, um, which is chest pain. Because it increases cardiac uh, performance, it will increase, again, like I said earlier, cardiac workload and oxygen demands. And when the heart demands increased blood flow, but it can't supply the tissue with the blood, it causes what's called ischemia and ischemic pain, which is um, angina. Yes, ma'am. It's unpredictable based on um, the patient history. Yeah. Okay. So whenever you give a beta agonist, beta-1 agonist, um, you increase the risk of angina by increasing oxygen demands and not knowing whether the heart can actually meet those oxygen demands. Beta-2 activation the use of beta-2 agonists clinically um, is normally targeted, the targets are limited to the lungs and the uterus. Okay. And the beta-2 drugs include, again, epinephrine, isoproterenol, and albuterol. So some of the therapeutic applications, some of the scenarios include the treatment of asthma. So activating beta-2 receptors promotes bronchodilation. Um, albuterol is usually the um, drug of choice. Isoproterenol can also be used. Uh, and usually this beta-2 um, agonism is through uh, an inhaler that directly delivers um, the drug to the lungs. And usually these drugs are what we call rescue drugs. So that it treats an acute asthma attack okay, where the, the uh, bronchiolar airways are constricted. We apply the beta-2 agonist, and it, it causes bronchodilation. And I mentioned um, this at some point, that the use of um, short-acting beta-2 agonists like albuterol um, when we overuse drugs like this, the lungs quickly adapt and become less sensitive to the drug. Okay? The receptors downregulate and um, the albuterol is less effective at causing bronchodilation. Okay? So um, these bronchodilators are used to treat asthma attacks, but they can only be effective in conjunction with good controller medications that reduce the number of attacks. Delay of preterm labor. So um, activation of beta-2 receptors in the uterus causes relaxation of that muscle. Uh, and so these drugs are very helpful in delaying preterm labor okay, to ensure that the fetus is not um, delivered too early. 
in patients with diabetes, okay, and it's primarily only with patients um, who have diabetes, beta-2 uh, drugs can cause hyperglycemia. Beta-2 agonists um, or beta-2 receptors are found on the liver, and when stimulated, they help increase blood sugar. Okay. So when you haven't eaten for a long time and you're in a fasting state, um, if, you, if you recall ever being in one of those fasting states, you feel a little jittery, right? And part of that is that your body releases a lot of um, sympathetic uh, hormones and, symp and, s and increases sympathetic stimulation. And one of the effects of that is enhancing liver um, release and production of glucose. So under normal conditions in a, in a healthy individual without diabetes, activation of beta receptors um, in the liver and in the skeletal muscle does cause release of glucose, but a, a person with a normal pancreas, normal pancreatic function, they'll have enough insulin release to counteract that, and so they won't have hyperglycemia. But in patients with diabetes, their pancreatic function is not normal. So using a beta agonist, beta-2 agonist in a diabetic patient increases the likelihood of, of hyperglycemia. And so these drugs might not um, be uh, used depending on the um, severity in a patient with diabetes. Yes? That's, so that's a very good question, whether this is a, a chronic administration or long term. I, I don't really know the answer to it. Um, I would guess that it depends on the on the on the patient, yeah. Whether it's whether a single episode is needed versus um, very very high risk um, continued. Okay. So adverse effects of beta two activation. Um, one of the most common side effects is tremor. Um, this is a sympathomimetic, so it enhances that. The, all of those fight or flight responses. Um, so tremor is, a, is the most common side effect. And it generally fades over time. Um, but it can, be, um, it can be minimized by initiating therapy at rather low doses so that uh, you acclimate to the drug um, over time rather than introducing this drug at higher doses um, immediately. I saw a hand up. So um, the release of insulin, so in someone without diabetes, whenever your blood sugar goes, um, uh, is elevated at all, you get a release of insulin to bring it back down. So um, it's not so much an activation of receptors, it's that the insulin response is normal um, and it keeps the glucose levels in check. They're not. They're not, no. Um, beta receptors are associated with um, enhanced sympathetic activity, which happens during fasting states to help elevate blood glucose. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we take a break? All right. Um, let's come back at... 10.45, okay? We'll take a 15-minute break.
say that they're antagonists or antagonists. I think they're antagonists. Antagonists for polymers. Drugs that are able to pass the blood brain barrier, can you stand up their charge? Because for one of these drugs, you mentioned that they were charged. So, charge drugs have a very different charge. Generally speaking, charge drugs are charged. Okay, for one of the drugs you mentioned, does pass the blood brain barrier? Right. So, Thank you. 
practice it actually successful. 
All right, guys, let's continue. Okay. So moving on, let's talk about the clinical consequences of dopamine receptor activation. So dopamine is one of the, our, our catecholamines. Uh, and it's, it's used primarily in the treatment of shock. So in the context of shock, blood pressure is um, extremely low, so you have a difficult time sending blood to organs. And one of those organs that you see um, vulnerable to this drop in, bl in blood pressure is, are the kidneys. So sometimes when, when patients in shock um, have that drop in blood pressure, it uh, leads to renal failure, okay? So the, the kidneys aren't getting enough blood to be able to filter that blood and, and perform their function. So dopamine in a patient with shock is used to dilate the renal blood vessels in order to reduce the risk of renal failure. Okay. Um, it also enhances cardiac performance by activating beta-1 receptors in the heart. Okay, so dopamine is going to be used in the treatment of shock for those two um, purposes. One form of shock that um, has a special cause is anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock happens uh, in severe allergic reactions. And some of the things you see with anaphylactic shock is hypotension, so a severe drop in blood pressure, bronchoconstriction, and edema of the glottis. So part of the swelling that happens in an allergic response can also affect the airways, and so it can compromise um, airway uh, patency. The treatment of choice for anaphylactic shock is epinephrine. That is going to be the, the treatment of choice for anaphylactic shock. Um, epinephrine is going to help um, support blood pressure, um, reduce that uh, uh, bronchoconstriction, and um, uh, help recover the airway. Epinephrine, which is our prototypic cat catecholamine, has other therapeutic uses. As I mentioned, it's used along with, um, it's administered along with a local anesthetic to help delay the distribution of that local anesthetic so it stays in the um, local area longer. Controls superficial bleeding. It elevates blood pressure. It helps to treat that AV nodal block. Restores cardiac function during cardiac arrest. It causes bronchiolar dilation in patients with asthma, and it's the treatment of choice for anaphylactic shock. Pharmacokinetics of epinephrine, it, it's a catecholamine, so you can't um, give it orally. It has to be given parenterally, and it's usually given either through intramuscular injection, subcutaneous, or intravenous. Okay. Under emergency circumstances, with anaphylactic shock or cardiac arrest, it's going to be given intravenously. Okay. And if an IV access can't be um, uh, secured quickly, you're going to give it what we call intraosseous. Okay. Has anybody ever seen an intraosseous injection? It's pretty dramatic. It's basically a little drill that drills through a bone and goes straight into the bone marrow. Okay. 
okay, because it's something that you can secure very quickly in a, in a cardiac arrest, and it will um, get into the bloodstream very quickly as well. So it has a fairly short half-life. So epinephrine will um, have a very quick effect, and that effect will, will be short-lived. Adverse effects of epinephrine um, is hypertensive crisis, so a blood pressure that gets too high. Um, it's uh, excessive activation of alpha-1 receptors. Uh, you see a dramatic increase in blood pressure, and with an I that increase in blood pressure, it can cause cerebral hemorrhage. Okay. You can also cause dysrhythmias. Excessive activation of beta-1 receptors in the heart can cause dysrhythmias which is a little more likely for patients with hyperthyroidism because of their sensitivity to catecholamines. Okay. Um, so patients with hyperthyroidism are a little more um, susceptible to dysrhythmias in the, when we use epinephrine. We also, because we're activating beta-1 receptors in the heart and we increase workload and oxygen demands, it can cause um, angina or chest pain if, in the case of extravasion, it can cause necrosis of tissue. Did, every, did you guys uh, learn what that is, extravasion? So that's when you have an IV access site and um, you lose access to the vein and the, um, whatever you're infusing actually just gets into the tissue. Okay. And so what you'll see is like a little bit of a bubble at the access site. And so epinephrine, because it's causing lots of vasoconstriction, will impair blood flow to that area of tissue and can cause necrosis, which is tissue death. Okay. Right. Um, if, if repeated in the same place, certainly. But the, the dosage and the preparations are going to be different with IM and sub-Q. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's going to depend also how soon the extravation is going to be uh, detected, right, and how long epinephrine is going to sit there at the site. Right, because you also have a constant endless supply of it in the, in the bag right, right. entering the tissue. Yeah. And then in diabetic patients, epinephrine can also cause hyperglycemia. Yes, ma'am. Anginal um, attack is going to be the same thing as an ischemic attack, yes. But it, you can actually have an ischemic event without anginal pain. Um, so anginal pain, anginal attack specifically is chest pain. Okay? But it's going to be caused by ischemia. So drug interactions with epinephrine, um, MAO inhibitors or MAOIs, um, MAO is the monoamine oxidase, is the enzyme that breaks down epinephrine. So blocking that breakdown um, can have adverse effects in terms of toxicity with epinephrine. Okay. So patients who are receiving MAOIs should not receive epinephrine. But MAOIs are really... Um, use less and less okay, because they have so many interactions with so many different drugs. Tricyclic antidepressants um, block the uptake of catecholamines into the adrenergic neuron. So blocking uptake can intensify or prolong epinephrine's effects. Okay. Uh, patients receiving tricyclic antidepressants may require a reduction in their epinephrine dose. And again, tricyclic antidepressants are not as commonly used as other antidepressants uh, because, like MAOIs, they have lots of drug interactions. Uh, general anesthetics, epinephrine um, can interfere with the effectiveness of general anesthesia. Um, alpha adrenergic blocking agents um, is going to reduce the effectiveness of, of epinephrine. Um, as are the beta-adrenergic blocking agents, are also going to block the effects of epinephrine. 
So the ways we administer epinephrine, as I mentioned earlier, um, an EpiPen, so patients with or people with um, severe allergies are um, encouraged to carry an EpiPen with them, which is a self-administrable dose of epinephrine. Okay. So patients with um, or people with peanut allergies should never be without an EpiPen. Patients with allergies to bee stings or any, re any um, allergy uh, where the response is a severe allergic response. Okay. Because if you can't administer epinephrine very quickly, that swelling of the glottis will compromise airway and can, can be a fatal reaction. Okay. So the EpiPen is really a bridge to, to buy you some time until you can get to um, medical care. IV administration, where we are going to monitor it very closely, obviously, uh, because of the likelihood for um, excessive hypertension and um, uh, cardiac activation. Intramuscular, subcutaneous, intracardiac, right, which is, is fairly rare, but it can be used during asystole, um, meaning when the heart has stopped um, pumping or stopped beating if IV is not available. So if, if anybody has, so if you can't get an IV access and you don't have the instruments for an intraosseous injection, you can actually give intracardiac. Um, and I'm dating myself because I'm older than you, but has anybody seen the, the movie Pulp Fiction? <laughs> yeah. It's a cult classic, so do you. I saw it in my 20s. You probably saw it last week, right? <laughs> But that's an example of an intracardiac injection of epinephrine, right? Um, so it's, it's as dramatic as it sounds. So it's, it's rare, but it, it, is, uh, it can actually um, be effective along with um, cardiopulmonary res uh, resuscitation. Intraspinal, um, inhaled, topical. So it, depending on uh, the purpose of the administration of epinephrine, we can use different um, uh, dosages and different preparations and, and routes of administration. <laughs> Norepinephrine, another catecholamine, receptor specificity, alpha-1, alpha-2, and beta-1. It has really low affinity for beta-2 receptors. Right, so um, there are other drugs that are a better choice if you're looking to activate beta-2 receptors. Therapeutic uses also for hypo hypotensive states cardiac arrest, um, and norepinephrine has the advantage of, of not promoting hyperglycemia in diabetic patients like epinephrine did. Okay. But because it's a catecholamine, you cannot give it orally. Okay. Isoproteranol, also a catecholamine, receptor specificity beta-1 and beta-2. Therapeutic uses for isoproteranol are mostly cardiac. AV heart block, cardiac arrest, um, and increased cardiac output during shock. It has fewer adverse effects um, than norepinephrine and epinephrine, okay, because it doesn't activate the alpha receptors. And preparations, again, you can't give it orally because it's a catecholamine, but we can give it IM, IV, um, and intracardiac injections as well. Dopamine also a catecholamine. Um, receptor specificity, it um, obviously has best, the best specificity for the dopamine receptors, um, and it has uh, also some specificity for the beta-1 receptor. Um, it can also act on alpha-1, beta-1 uh, receptors, but it requires a higher dose, okay? At um, low doses, it'll uh, be specific to dopamine at moderate doses for dopamine and beta-1, and then at higher doses, you can get an alpha-1 uh, effect. Therapeutic uses, as I mentioned, um, shock with, uh, to increase cardiac output and enhance renal perfusion. We also use dopamine um, in certain cases with heart failure to increase contractility and cardiac performance. The um, 
dopamine is prepared in an aqueous solution. Um, it really must be diluted, and the administration is um, primarily IV. On beta-1 receptors, do, uh, dobutamine is a drug that has a specificity for beta-1 receptors. So it's going to be a drug that we're targeting the heart. Um, and the, one of the major uses for dobutamine is in congestive heart failure. Okay. And um, it's going to be through a continuous IV infusion. Okay, so Dibutamine, as you can imagine, is going to be given to patients who are hospitalized for congestive heart failure to enhance heart function. Phenylephrine. It's a non-ketocholamine. It's an alpha-1 agonist. Its therapeutic uses, very commonly used as, an, as a nasal anti-congestant. Okay? So it reduces nasal congestion. Um, it elevates blood pressure when given parenterally. It can dilate the pupils when given as an eye drop. And it can also be used with a local anesthetic to delay absorption like we saw with epinephrine. Okay. Albuterol. I'm sorry, yes. Um, it can be used um, in orally. It can be used as a nasal spray. Um, I'm not aware of it being used topically. I mean, topically, as a nasal spray, that's being used topically. Okay. So I, I'm not aware of it being in a cream or anything like that. Yeah. Albuterol. Very, very common drug. It's a non-catecholamine. Uh, it's very specific to the beta-2 receptor, and so its target is going to be um, the bronchiolar airways. And it's going to be a critical drug in the treatment of asthma. Um, the adverse effects of albuterol at therapeutic doses are really quite minimal. Okay? Because also, when you're, when you're taking albuterol, the doses are measured so that it's much more a topical application than it is a systemic. It will activate beta-1 receptors at higher doses, and the most common effects, uh, adverse effects of albuterol is in terms of tremor or tachycardia if, if the doses are high enough to, to get into the systemic circulation. Ephedrine, also a non-catecholamine. The receptor specificity is wide, so it acts on alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. So it has a ver it's a very mixed-acting drug. Right? So di different um, doses will, will produce different effects. It can be used in the treatment of asthma, in the treatment of shock. It can be used... Um, in the treatment of anesthesia-induced hypotension. So sometimes when in the course of um, anesthesia, blood pressure can go down, so ephedrine can be used to elevate that blood pressure. Uh, use during breastfeeding is not recommended because it does get into the breast milk. And some of the side effects include loss of appetite uh, because it, it decreases gastric emptying, so food stays in your stomach for longer. So um, ephedrine has been used for short-term weight loss because of this um, tendency to suppress appetite. Uh, but ephedrine used for, these, for this weight loss um, purpose uh, was found to be detrimental in people who, had, um, who were vulnerable to heart, um, heart disease. Adrenergic antagonists, so blockers of the adrenergic receptors. They cause direct blockade of adrenergic receptors. Um, and with, uh, with the exception of one, they all produce reversible um, competitive blockade. Okay, so there's only one antagonist that 
uh, doesn't, but most of them do. Most adrenergic antagonists are more selective than the adrenergic agonists. Okay, so the blockers are, are have more specificity than the than the agonists. So we've got alpha adrenergic blocking agents and we've got beta adrenergic blocking agents. So while this may look daunting because there's a lot of drugs in this list, um, if you notice, and this is going to be true um, for a lot of classes of drugs, they'll all, um, classes of drugs often have the same, um, end in the same group of letters. So um, if you look at, for example, the alpha-1 selective blockers, they all stand, they all end in osin. Okay, so if you see an osin, you know that's an alpha-1 selective agent. Um, and then in the beta adrenergic blockers, they all end in lol, right? Which will not make you laugh out loud, but <laughs> will help you, um, could be lots of love, right? Um, it will help you identify the beta blockers, okay? So um, in the list of these a alpha and beta uh, blockers, you notice that we have agents that are non-selective. So the non-selective adrenergic blockers, um, phenoxabenzamine benzamine is alpha-1, alpha-2, phentolamine, alpha-1, alpha-2. The ozins are specific to alpha-1. They're selective for alpha-1. Beta adrenergic blockers, um, we've got, they're all lols, whether they're um, non-selective or selective, so it's going to take some energy to remember which is which. But some are act on both, while some act on just beta-1. Okay. So with alpha blockade, alpha-1, alpha-2 blockade, um, there are some um, key therapeutic applications. And what's, what's nice about the neuropharmacology coming right before the cardiac section is that a lot of the drugs are the same. Okay, so the next unit is the cardiac drugs, and we're going to see some of the same names over again. So essential hypertension, which is also called primary hypertension and is the most common form of hypertension, um, alpha blockers, particularly alpha-1 blockers, uh, cause vasodilation and help reduce blood pressure. Okay. So the alpha-1 receptors actually act on both the arterial system and the venous system. Okay. And by blocking the um, venous system, by, by causing venous dilation, it... Um, actually affects return of blood to the heart, actually decreases return of blood to the heart, reduces, reduces cardiac output, and when you reduce cardiac output, you're going to reduce blood pressure. Okay. And then on the arterial system, by causing vasodilation, you're more directly reducing um, heart pr uh, blood pressure. It can also be used, these alpha blockers are also used to treat the tox toxicity um, from alpha-1 agonists. Okay. But we do also see necrosis at the site in the, in the case of extravasion. So when we get um, infil infiltration of the region with phentolamine, for example, which is a um, non-selective alpha antagonist, um, it blocks vasoconstriction. Um, I'm sorry, it can reverse or treat extravasion um, necrosis because okay, it blocks the vasoconstriction. So the epinephrine that gets extravated okay, and causes the vasoconstriction that can lead to death of the tissue, phentolamine can actually reverse the vasoconstriction and reduce tissue death. Other therapeutic applications of alpha blockade, benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. Um, this is a very, very common disorder that, that happens to men as they get older. The uh, prostate gland enlarges as testosterone levels go down when men age. 
and running through the prostate gland is the urethra. Okay. So as the prostate enlarges, it can pinch the urethra and cause um, a very predictable set of symptoms. So um, dysuria, increased frequency of urination, nocturia, urinary hesitancy, urinary urgency, a sense of incomplete voiding, and the reduction in the, in the size and force of the urinary stream. Okay. Alpha-1 receptors um, reduce the contraction of the smooth muscle in the prostate uh, capsule and the bladder neck. Another disorder, pheochromocytoma, is a tumor, it's a benign tumor that produces catecholamines. Okay. It's usually located in the adrenal medulla, the inner um, portion of the adrenal gland. And by overproducing catecholamines, it principally causes um, hypertension. Okay. And usually activation of alpha-1 um, uh, and beta-1 receptors uh, contribute. So the best treatment is surgery, uh, but application of an alpha block blocker can, can assist in the treatment of this um, benign tumor, catecholamine-releasing tumor. Okay. Another place where we see the use of alpha-1 blockers is in Raynaud's uh, disease. Or, or another term for it is Raynaud's phenomenon. This is, um, has multiple causes, but with Raynaud's, what you see is a temper temperature-dependent change in the blood flow to the extremities. Okay. You see a temperature-dependent change in the blood flow to the extremities. So in cold weather, you get vasoconstriction and it causes a, um, either a blanching, so the, so the hands and the feet either turn white or they turn blue. Okay. So in cold weather, you get this inappropriate constriction, and either the hands and the feet will, will turn white, they'll blanch, or they'll turn blue. And then when you warm up the hands and feet again, blood flow returns, and um, it's very painful when the blood flow returns, and the hands and feet tend to turn red. Okay. So the alpha blockers um, can help reduce the vasospasms in the toes and in the feet, as you mean the feet and the hands, um, that, that causes the Raynaud's. Adverse effects of alpha-1 blockade, um, mostly by the alpha-1 receptors. Um, the alpha-2 receptor effects are really minor, so the um, adverse effects are really a, a function of blockade of the alpha-1 receptor. So one of them is orthostatic hypotension. So this is that tendency for, um, with changes in body position, blood pressure drops. So when you're moving from um, a, a laying down position to just sitting up in bed or, or standing up out of bed, okay, you, normally your, your blood vessels constrict to maintain adequate blood flow to your brain. But when you have alpha blockade, alpha-1 blockade, you're blocking some of that vasoconstriction. And so you get less blood flow to the brain and your blood pressure drops and you can feel dizzy. You can, that enhances the risk for what? Falls, right? And you can even get your blood pressure um, lowering so much that you can get what's called syncope or, or fainting. Okay. So the orthostatic hypotension is especially um, uh, attributable to the blockade of alpha receptors in veins, since the veins are responsible for returning blood to the heart. Okay. 
and the veins are very lax. They don't um, have a lot. They're very compliant. They don't rub, um, resist being expanded. So in the presence of alpha blockers, um, the veins can uh, be ineffective in their ability to return blood to the heart, which uh, will very quickly cause hypotension. Okay. Another adverse effect of alpha blockade is reflex tachycardia. Now, reflex tachycardia is exactly what it sounds like. It's an elevation of heart rate that is a reflexive reaction to a drop in blood pressure. Okay. So it's a tachycardia or an elevation of heart rate that's a reflexive response to a drop in blood pressure. Yes? Um, ref so reflexive tachycardia or, or a change in heart rate, well, a change in heart rate happens anytime blood pressure changes, right? And it changes in the opposite direction, no matter what the cause. Um, I'm not sure I quite understand, uh, I'm not sure I quite understand what you're asking me. Do you want to reword it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, so blood loss is one example of a drop, of a reason for a drop in blood pressure. Yeah, absolutely. So reflexive tachycardia um, is something that, that can happen with alpha-1 blockade. Um, and uh, people are going to be particularly vulnerable to it um, when you are first starting to take an alpha-1 blocker. Nasal congestion, so with alpha receptor agonism, we saw with um, phenylephrine, we saw the decongestion. So now we're blocking alpha receptors, which causes dilation of the blood vessels um, and enhanced mucus production. Inhibition of ejaculation, so alpha-1 activation is required for ejaculation. Um, the, it can cause... Um, Impotence, which is reversible, and it's resolved when the drug is discontinued. Sodium retention and increased blood volume. Reduced blood pressure can enhance the renal retention of sodium and water, which expands blood volume um, and... Uh, so it's usually combined with a diuretic. So when we use an alpha blocker to treat hypertension, we also often use a diuretic to, to block this sodium and water retention. Okay? And we'll talk in, in the cardiovascular drugs, we'll talk about combination um, therapy when we're using multiple combinations of drugs uh, to, to min minimize um, or treat cardiovascular disease. So... Most significant adverse effect associated with alpha-2 blockade is potentiation of, tach of reflex tachycardia. So when we're using a non-selective alpha blocker, when we're using a non-selective alpha blocker, and we get alpha-1 and alpha-2 blockade, you're actually more likely to see reflex tachycardia. And the reflex tachycardia, the reflex that we're talking about is a reflex called the baroreceptor reflex or sometimes referred to as the baroreflex. And as I said, it's any time um, the baroreflex is designed to compensate for any moment-to-moment -moment changes in blood pressure. So a drop in blood pressure will cause an elevation of heart rate and an elevation of blood pressure will cause a decrease in heart rate. But the elevation in heart rate is a sympathetic response that involves the release of norepinephrine and blocking the alpha-2 receptor 
will make more norepinephrine available at the synapse, okay, which is why we see the, the reflex tachycardia more likely. Yes. The baroreceptor reflex is um, in part a sympathetic reflex when the heart rate goes up. And it involves the release of norepinephrine in the heart. So when we block alpha-2 receptors, when we block alpha-2 receptors, that presynaptic receptor, we're allowing more norepinephrine to be available at the synapse. Okay. So we're making that reflex tachycardia more likely to occur. And if, if you have a reflex tachycardia, um, response, it can be blocked using a beta adrenergic blocking agent. Okay. So the, the non-selective agents for the alpha um, receptors, as I mentioned, um, were the phenoxabenzamine and phentolamine. And then the alpha-1 selective agents for alpha-1 receptors are the, um, are the ozins, or the osins. Okay. Um, prazosin is our prototypic. Okay. It operates through, through, through very basic competitive antagonism. So it competes, directly competes for the alpha-1 receptor. It's very selective for the alpha-1 receptor, like all of these selective blockers. It leads to dilation of arterioles and veins. Okay. It also leads to relaxation of the smooth muscle in the neck of the bladder and the prostatic capsule. Okay. It's only approved for the treatment of hypertension, but it can also benefit men with BPH. So if you have uh, an older man with hypertension and some signs of BPH, prazosin actually can be effective at, at helping to treat both of the, those problems. It, it can be administered orally. The hypertensive effects peak at one to three hours after um, the dose is administered, and it persists for 10 hours. It undergoes hepatic metabolism, excretion through bile, and 10% of it is eliminated through the urine. So as you can imagine, the half-life is two to three hours. So as you can imagine, in patients with liver disease, we want to use it with caution, because okay, it will tend to extend the half-life of it. Adverse effects, orthostatic hypertension, reflex tachycardia, inhibition of ejaculation, nasal congestion, and 1% of patients have what we call a first dose effect, meaning that the first time they take this drug, they will lose consciousness. Okay? So if you're in that 1%, it's an unlucky 1%, right? Just the first time. So, so when a person, so knowing this, when a person takes the first dose that they've ever taken, you want to advise that they are sitting down or laying down, <laughs> all right, just in case they are in that first, that 1%, all right? It's, it's due to very extreme venous dilation and a drop in, it's the same mechanism that causes the hypotension, the orthostatic hypotension, okay? Okay. Terrazin another um, alpha-1 selective blocker, um, and also uh, competes for the alpha-1 receptor, is approved for both hypertension and BPH. It peaks at one or two hours after an oral administration and has a half-life of 9 to 12 hours. So it it's lasts for much longer than, than um, prazosin. You get uh, once daily dosing, usually. Uh, but it's, it has a similar pattern of metabolism and excretion. 
So hepatic metabolism, excretion through both bile and urine. And then adverse effects, again, are very similar. Um, orthostatic hypotension, reflex tachycardia, nasal congestion, headache, because um, causing vasodilation in cerebral um, vessels will tend to cause headache. And the, also, you get um, a first dose effect in some, in some people. Doxazin, also a competitive blocker for the alpha-1 receptor, also treats hypertension and BPH. Also administered orally, peak effects are two to three hours, half-life 22 hours. Okay, so again, much, much longer duration of action. Once a day dosing, it has some protein binding, which is why the half-life is so long. Okay and has extensive hepatic metabolism and almost exclusively, exclusively biliary excretion. Okay. So again, caution with, with liver um, impairment. Adverse effects, the same, um, same group of effects, orthostatic hypotension, reflex tachycardia, nasal congestion, and first dose effect. Tamsulosin. Um, also, a selective blockade of alpha-1 receptors. Um, it's only approved for BPH. It tends to have um, selective action or predominant action on the smooth muscle of the neck of the bladder and the prostatic capsule. Okay. And the urethra, the part of the urethra that, that goes through the, the, the prostate. So, and the, the trade name will help you remember the therapeutic application, right? Yeah. Flomax. <laughs> Adverse effects. So, some of the same ones. Headache because of vasodilation of cerebral vessels. Dizziness, um, is that orthostatic hypotension. Abnormal ejaculation. Uh, and rhinitis, which is the nasal congestion. Drug interactions. Cimetidine, right, which is an, an H2 blocking anti, uh, antacid, uh, increases the possibility for toxicity. So if a patient is on cimetidine, um, or if, if a patient is on uh, Flomax tam, ta, uh, tamsulosin, you want to avoid cimetidine, right, because it can enhance the, the toxicity. Other hypotensive drugs, okay, um, and drugs that treat um, erectile dysfunction, like Viagra, can cause a significant reduction in blood pressure. Okay, so you don't really want to combine this drug with um, hypertensive, antihypertensive drugs, and you don't want to combine it with um, Viagra. Yes, sir. Um, Flomax alone, you would, in a healthy, otherwise healthy individual, you would not expect to, to cause hypotension. Yeah. But remember, in patients with, um, it, uh, these drugs are, are mostly hepatic, uh, through he hepatic metabolism. So in, in patients with liver dysfunction, you might see more exaggerated um, hypotension. Um, it's a good question. So, um, and I, I mean, I, I personally know that um, there's lots of anecdotal evidence of, of men on Flomax that do experience episodes of hypotension. So, um, it's usually when you see a drug being preferential for a particular organ or a particular group of, of um, receptors, it's usually a dose-related effect. So, um, the, at the doses that are therapeutic for BPH, you tend to see less of a cardiovascular response. Yeah. Um, al Alfuzosin, 
um, al also only indicated for BPH, okay? um, selective at the alpha-1 receptor. It is formulated in extended-release tablets, so absorption can be um, slow, but it also undergoes hepatic metabolism, um, and the half-life is uh, 10 hours, which is certainly not as long as some of the longest acting alpha-1 blockers, but um, is, is not as short as the shortest, right? Adverse effects, it's generally well tolerated. The most common adverse effect is dizziness, right, which is going to be a, a cardiovascular um, alpha-1 effect. Does not interfere with ejaculation, but um, can prolong the QT interval. Okay, so in patients with dysrhythmias or QT already um, on other QT drugs, you want to avoid. It is a powerful inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 um, 3A4 system, which um, is the same system that um, drugs like erythromycin, uh, clarithromycin, uh, and some protease inhibitors act through. So when taking this particular drug for BPH, you want to avoid um, giving it when patients are on other drugs that act through this um, 3A4 system. Okay. And then um, taking it with caution when you're also on antihypertensive medications, like organic nitrates, um, because it's going to um, potentiate the antihypertensive effects. Okay. And it can increase the likelihood of extreme hypotension and syncope. And then again, um, Viagra, since that is also an, um, has a um, blood pressure lowering effect, you want to avoid. Psilocin, alpha adrenergic antagonist, selective for alpha one. Um, the blockade on the vascular alpha one receptor is very weak, uh, so it's only indicated for the treatment of BPH. It's also well tolerated. Um, you can end up with reduced elimination or release of, of semen during orgasms, so it does affect ejaculation in some, to some degree. Um, also can produce dizziness, lightheadedness, and nasal congestion. Okay, so these drugs all have very similar effects because they're, they belong to the same class. Yes, sir. So when we are, so this is a very good question. So the question is, is that the side effects that are not mentioned, um, do they not cause them? So when we're going over a class of drugs like this, um, what you can assume is that the drug acts exactly like the prototypic drug, and I'm only mentioning the exceptions, right? So the class of alpha-1 um, receptor antagonists uh, tend to treat BPH and hypertension with the, and then the exception here is that this is only treating BPH and it has, um, instead of blocking ejaculation, it can just reduce the amount of semen. You get what I'm saying? So um, also, I, I'm not mentioning that it's metabolized by the liver, but it, it is, right, because it's acting just like the other drugs. Okay, so, that, so that's really why when I was talking about when you're studying these drugs, that <coughs> if you're making cards, the prototypic drug will have the most information, and then the non-prototypic drug will just have the exceptions, because if you're learning what the prototypic drug does, you can extend it to the non-prototypic, okay? Phentolamine. So phentolamine um, was that non-selective um, alpha blocker, so it, can, it blocks alpha-1 and alpha-2. Um, it's also a competitive antagonist. Um, approved application is diagnosis and treatment of theochromocytoma, 
that was the disease of the benign tumor that produces catecholamines. Okay. So, and then also used to reduce tissue necrosis after extravation of drugs like um, epinephrine or norepinephrine, right, the, the alpha-1 agonists, and reversal of soft tissue anesthesia. So when we're giving local anesthesia and we're giving norepinephrine or epinephrine with it to keep it in the site, if we want to reverse that anesthesia and reduce the numbing, we can give phentolamine, and it will cause dilation, and the drug will diffuse. Okay? So if you end up with local anesthesia, tissue anesthesia that is um, persisting for too long, or if it's too um, paralytic, you can give phentolamine, and it will tend to um, help reverse that anesthesia. Adverse effects, some of the same um, uh, ones, right? Orthostatic hypotension, reflex tachycardia, nasal congestion, inhibition of ejaculation. Contraindicated in patients with angina pectoralis and myocardial infarction. Okay. Um, profound hypotension, uh, treat with norepinephrine. Okay. So if phentolamine causes profound hypotension, you can treat that with norepinephrine. Phenooxybenzamine. Phenooxybenzamine. This drug also a non-selective alpha blocker, so it blocks alpha one and alpha two. Um, it's a non-competitive uh, receptor antagonist. So this was the one um, case, right? This is the one exception to the rule of these alpha blockers being competitive antagonists. And it's really only used to treat the pheochromocytoma. Has some of the same adverse effects. And the hypotension that it produces is somewhat irreversible. But it can be corrected with an alpha-1 agonist. Okay. So um, the hypotension can be more prolonged since, since the non-competitive receptor antagonists tend to, to be um, uh, a little more irreversible than, than the competitive ones. So in, in order to restore blood pressure in that case, patients must be given IV fluids to elevate blood pressure by increasing blood volume. Okay. Excuse me, it cannot be corrected by alpha agonist. I, I misread that. So the hypotension with phenoxybenzamine, you can't reverse it with an alpha agonist. Okay. Um, if you recall, this, is the, this was the effect of um, changing the effectiveness of the agonist in the presence of the antagonist, okay. where you cannot reverse it by just giving an agonist. You have to just give fluids. All right, beta antagonists. Okay. The beta adrenergic antagonists um, are predominantly, the beta-1 adrenergic antagonists are predominantly um, cardiovascular, and there's really very little to no therapeutic um, reasons to give a beta-2 antagonist. Really, we're, we're, when we're giving a beta antagonist, we're, we're targeting the cardiovascular system, and namely the heart. So therapeutic applications, anginal pain, angina pectoralis, blocking beta-1 receptors, decreasing cardiac workload, which reduces oxygen demands and prevents ischemia and ischemic pain. Hypertension, treating hypertension. Um, historically, these beta blockers have, were a drug of choice for hypertension. Um, recently, we're, we're noticing um, less of a benefit than we previously thought and more of a benefit with some of the other drugs that help with hypertension, like diuretics or like alpha blockers. 
It can also be used to treat certain cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, it can be used to treat um, myocardial infarction. Okay. Uh, the beta blockers can reduce pain during a myocardial infarction. It can also reduce infarct size, mortality, and the risk of reinfarction. Okay. And again, it's by reducing um, cardiac oxygen demands and risk of ischemia. Heart failure, it's uh, considered the standard therapy for heart failure. Um, and previously, beta blockers were thought to be a contraindication in heart failure. So now heart failure can be treated using beta agonists and beta antagonists depending on the, on the patient's um, profile. We also... Um, use beta adrenergic antagonists to, in the treatment of hyperthyroidism. It is um, hyperthyroidism, uh, the heart is more sensitive to catecholamines. When you have elevated thyroid hormone levels, your heart is more sensitive to catecholamines. So beta blockers can help um, reduce that. And um, in hyperthyroidism, the normal levels of sympathetic activity to the heart can cause things like tachycardia, tachy um, dysrhythmias, and angina. Okay, so the beta blockers can help reduce that. Um, migraine prophylaxis. When you take it prophylactically, beta adrenergic blockers can reduce the frequency and intensity of migraine attacks. Okay. Um, but it cannot stop a migraine once it's begun. Okay, so it can, it can reduce the number of attacks, but it can't stop a migraine once it's, become, once it's uh, begun. And the mechanism by which beta blockers prevent migraines is not well understood. Beta, beta blockers can also um, lead to headaches. So the mechanism behind the the um, production of headaches when you use a beta blocker um, is better understood than how it reduces migraine um, occurrences. And then stage fright. Beta blockers um, are also used to, to produce some anti-anxiety effects, right? And so people who, who experience stage fright with public speaking are thought to be, um, to reduce their anxiety when taking low doses of, of beta blockers. And it's mostly by reducing the symptoms of stage fright like tachycardia, tremors, um, excessive sweating, right, which is brought, a, brought about by activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So you're talking to a big crowd, um, and your body thinks that you're being chased by a lion, right? So you, you take a beta blocker, and it reduces those effects. But the anti-anxiety um, effects of beta blockers is really, is really limited, okay? And people also report that they, um, their thinking and their um, reactions are blunted, and so there's, there's definitely a cost to be paid for taking a beta blocker for stage fright. Also, um, in the treatment of pheochromocytoma, we can also use beta blockers. Um, and it's mostly to block the effects of the catecholamines on the heart. We also use beta blockers um, in the treatment of glaucoma. Uh, in glaucoma, we have elevated intraocular pressure that damages the optic nerve. So beta blockers can actually reduce intraocular pressure to help um, prevent further injury to the optic nerve. Okay. So therapeutic responses to beta blockers are almost entirely a beta-1 effect. So when we're using a beta blocker, our target is a beta-1 receptor. Uh, but adverse effects of using beta blockers 
uh, stem from both beta-1 and beta-2 blockade. Okay. Non-selective beta-adrenergic blockers, okay, the ones that block both receptors, produce a more broad spectrum of adverse effects than do the more cardioselective beta-adrenergic antagonists. Okay. So the, the more selective uh, beta-1 receptor antagonists will produce fewer adverse effects effects than um, the non-selective ones, as you might imagine. So adverse effects of beta-1 blockade, and okay, not the beta-2, but beta-1 blockade. Adverse effects include bradycardia. So blocking the beta-1 receptors in the heart tends to reduce heart rate um, and can cause bradycardia. You also have reduced cardiac output. So beta blockers mediate um, increases in heart rate and also increases in contractility. Okay. So when we apply a beta blocker, heart rate goes down, contractility goes down, so cardiac output will, will get reduced. Okay. Precipitation of heart failure. So if the reduction in cardiac output is um, significant enough, you can cause people to go into heart failure. And some of the effects of heart failure, um, or some of the signs of heart failure, include shortness of breath, nighttime coughing, swelling of the extremities, okay? And um, if the patient has any of these signs, they need to immediately um, discontinue their beta blocker and, and talk to their um, their pres prescriber. Beta blockers can also um, lead to AV heart block. So you notice that we talked about norepinephrine and epinephrine being a treatment for AV heart block. Well, the beta blockers um, can precipitate heart block okay, by reducing conductivity um, of the cells of the AV node. And beta blockers are contraindicated in patients with any pre-existing AV nodal block. Okay. We also, some more um, adverse effects of a, uh, beta-1 blockade. With beta-1 blockade, you can see rebound excitation. Okay. So if a person misses a dose of their beta blocker, um, as the beta blocker starts to wear off, if they, if they delay their dose of beta blocker, they can experience um, tachycardia or palpitations as a result of, of rebound excitation of the heart. Okay. And it's really important that patients taper their, when they discontinue their drugs, that they taper their dose um, over a t one to two week period. Bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstriction happens as a result of beta-2 blockade. Okay? So if you're on a beta blocker and you see beta, um, and you, you start to see beta uh, bronchoconstriction, this is really a, a blockade of beta-2 effect. Okay? So beta blockers are generally contraindicated in patients with asthma. So asthma patients need beta, very specific beta-1 selective drugs, and the drug of choice in that case is what we call mipropolol. Um, you'll, as we'll talk about in a moment, propranolol is our prototypic beta blocker, and metropolol is, is, is ac you'll actually see more metropolol than you will see propranolol clinically, um, and it's the drug of choice with patients um, who need a beta blocker and also have asthma. And sometimes you'll also see hypoglycemia um, with a beta blocker from the inhibition of glycogenolysis. Um, if a patient with diabetes, and again this is more likely with a patient with diabetes, um, requires a beta blocker, it's really important that they get a beta-1 selective blocker, like metropolol. Yes? Yeah, it's because of bronchoconstriction. Yeah. So if you had 
If you have someone with any history of respiratory problems, you're going to steer away from the non-selective beta blockers. Yeah. Um, but patients with asthma, because asthma is um, the defining problem is bronchospasm, it's especially important. So um, whenever we mention these, these exceptions, the asthma, diabetes, um, patients with liver disease, you want to pay particular note to that, okay? So we've already um, talked about drugs that you want to avoid in patients with asthma, in patients with diabetes, and alternate drugs that you want to go to for those patients, all right? So those are the kind of things that um, come up uh, frequently. Okay. So hint, hint. <laughs> Highlight. So adverse effects in neonates from beta-1 and beta-2 blockade. Um, the use of beta blockers during pregnancy can have residual effects on, on newborn infants. And there are times where you, 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 you must treat a pregnant woman with a beta blocker. There's no um, getting around it. Uh, beta blockers remain in circulation for several days after birth. So in neonates, um, they may be at risk for bradycardia and respiratory distress and hypoglycemia. Okay. So those are, those are things that um, if a woman is on a beta blocker um, in, the, in the neonatal period, immediately after birth, you want to be very careful and, and monitor that, pa that baby for those, those problems. Okay. So propranolol is our prototypic beta blocker. Okay? Propranolol is our prototypic beta blocker. Um, it blocks the, the cardiac beta-1 receptor, causing reduced heart rate, decreased force of ventricular contraction, suppressed impulse through the AV node. Okay? Um, the net effect is a reduction in cardiac output. It also blocks the renal beta-1 receptor, and so pranolol can suppress the secretion of renin. Blocking beta, it also blocks beta-2 receptors, so it can cause bronchoconstriction. Um, it can also cause um, vasoconstriction through blocking of the beta-2 receptors on certain blood vessels. You also see reduced glycogenolysis uh, by blocking the beta-2 receptor on skeletal muscle and liver. So propranolol is one of those beta blockers that you want to avoid when in patients with asthma, avoid in patients with diabetes. Propranolol is highly lipid soluble, readily crosses membranes. It's well absorbed after oral administration. It has extensive metabolism on first pass through the liver. Um, it gets widely distributed to all tissues and organs, including the central nervous system. Okay. So it has extensive hepatic metabolism, and it's excre excreted through the urine. Okay. So you can imagine that the oral doses are very high compared to what reaches the bloodstream. Okay. And so since it has extensive first-pass metabolism through the liver, in patients with liver dysfunction, you want to be very careful giving them propranolol um, or avoid it entirely. Therapeutic uses, hypertension, angina, myocardial infarction, um, particularly post-treatment with myocardial infarction, prevention of migraines, and stage fright. Okay. Adverse effects, as you might guess, bradycardia where atropine or isoproteranol can be the antidote to this. AV heart block, okay. Uh, propranolol is going to be contraindicated in patients with any pre-existing AV block. Okay. Heart failure, treat, um, some patients can be treated uh, with propranolol for heart failure. Okay. And in patients with pre-existing heart disease, um, in some patients, the suppression of myocardial contracti contractility with propranolol can actually precipitate um, heart failure. So 
it's one of those drugs that's, that can treat heart failure in some patients and it can cause heart failure in other patients. Rebound cardiac excitation, abrupt withdrawal can cause this um, excitation of the heart uh, and you can result in tachycardia and ventricular dysrhythmias. Bronchoconstriction uh, and hypo, uh, uh, hypoglycemia. And it, since it's highly lipid soluble, it also crosses the blood brain barrier into the central nervous system and it can predispose people to depression. Okay. Drug interactions, calcium channel blockers, um, calcium channel blockers tend to um, are also used in the treatment of cardiovascular disease and it helps reduce blood pressure. Okay, so um, calcium channel blockers can cause uh, a certain degree of vasodilation. So using propranolol along with, with calcium channel blockers can um, run the risk of extreme hypotension. And then since propranolol um, blocks the the breakdown of stored glucose by the liver and can cause hypoglycemia. Uh, giving propranolol along with insulin increases the risk for hypoglycemia. And finding an effective dose for propranolol can be a little bit um, challenging. Uh, it can be a certain degree of uh, trial and error. The preparations for propranolol are generally oral and IV. And then the dosage really depends on the indication. Okay. So depending on why the person is being given propranolol, um, sh uh, smaller doses, maybe spread over a lar longer period of time, are better than um, higher doses. You also frequently see propranolol given in divided doses. So you might find that a person is on um, a lower dose of propranolol four times a day. Okay, that's, that's quite common, be taking a beta blocker in divided doses. Um, and then the, oftentimes the pre-assessments necessary for giving propranolol, you will often need to, to uh, measure heart rate and blood pressure when you give a, a beta blocker. So precautions and, and warnings. Uh, some people have severe allergies to propranolol. Um, you want to avoid propranolol in diabetic patients. Um, you want to avoid propranolol in cardiac um, patients with heart failure, some patients with heart failure, patients with respiratory problems, and um, psychiatric disorders, particularly depression. Okay, if a patient has a uh, history of depression, you want to avoid propranolol. And then um, in neonates. And as much as possible pregnant women since it will affect um, neonatal function. Metropolol. It's a selective beta-1 blocker. Okay? It's a second generation beta-1 blocker. It's very, very common drug. Um, it's not likely to cause bronchoconstriction or hypoglycemia. So it's, it's a preferred beta blocker for asthmatics and diabetics. It's also very lipid soluble. It's well absorbed through oral administration, but also has extensive metabolism through the liver, first pass uh, through the liver. And it's eliminated uh, by hepatic metabolism and renal excretion. Therapeutic uses, hypertension, uh, angina, heart failure, myocardial infarction. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the um, the effect that so beta blockers fall under a large category of CNS depressants. Yeah, they will tend to, to depress CNS function, which is why they um, they all increase the risk of depression in patients. And that's going to be particularly true if you're, if you're combining a beta blocker with, with another CNS depressant. So you, you want to be careful how many CNS depressants you're giving a patient. So adverse effects, some of the same ones we've mentioned, bradycardia, reduced cardiac output, 
AV, heart block, rebound excitation, um, but really um, minimal bronchoconstriction or, or um, uh, uh, hypoglycemia. So you want to, you don't want to give this drug in patients with any degree of sinu uh, sinus bradycardia or AV block. Uh, for the same reasons that we want to avoid that in propranolol, because it can increase the likelihood of those things. You want to use it with caution in patients with heart failure. It's safer than propranolol in uh, patients with asthma or a history of severe allergic reactions. Okay. So if a patient has a history of an allergy to propranolol, metropolol could be a, a good alternative. It can be used more safely um, in diabetics, uh, and metropolol, however, while it doesn't cause hypoglycemia, it can mask some of the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Now, this, and this is important because that means that if you're giving a diabetic a, a beta blocker, obviously you want to choose metropolol, but you also want to have them be much more vigilant about their um, um, checking their blood glucose with with respect to treatment. Um, when when someone is is hypoglycemic, the first signs and symptoms are signs and symptoms of increased sympathetic activity. Okay, so when somebody um, first becomes hypoglycemic, all of the signs and symptoms are symptoms of sympathetic activity. So increased heart rate increased sweating, you feel kind of jittery, okay? And that is supposed to make you aware of your hypoglycemia so that you can go eat something. Okay? Because if you don't go eat something, your blood glucose will continue to drop, and the next set of, of symptoms is um, are neurological, okay? Where you'll start to, you might lose consciousness, you will potentially start um, exhibiting inappropriate behavior, okay? Um, you might have a seizure. It, so there's, there's a constellation of neurological problems that happen after the sympathetic um, symptoms. But if you're on a beta blocker, you might not notice those sympathetic sy symptoms, okay? So for diabetic patients, you want to really... Um, be very cautious. Other beta adrenergic blockers, labetalol, carv carvitalol, very, very common. Um, they differ from other beta blockers because they, they um, will also block some of the alpha adrenergic receptors. So they can cause orthostatic hypotension, they can cause insomnia and depression. Um, they can dilate vessels um, by blocking the alpha-1 receptor. So they, they tend to have um, some, share some of the same problems as the alpha blockers. Nabivalol causes vasodilation by promoting synthesis of nitric oxide. So it has a different um, mechanism than the other beta blockers. Pindalol acts as a partial agonist for the beta adrenergic receptor. Um, so this is a partial agonist, partial antagonist, right, pindalol. So it has very little effect on resting heart rate and cardiac output. So it, it will have extremely mild effects compared to the other beta blockers.